Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, pessoal. Canal Riftec ao vivo. Vamos só conferir se está tudo funcionando, se vocês já estão me vendo aí. Hoje, uma noite especial, hein? Hoje temos a presença do Vincent Chalias, biólogo marinho, uma pessoa muito especial que eu venho acompanhando já há um bom tempo. Uh, diria que hoje nós vamos ter uma aula aqui sobre corais. Uh, preparamos um material muito interessante, que já foi, inclusive, é, parte de palestras, uh, é, de feiras, uh, e uh, eu diria para vocês que eu vou aprender junto com vocês aqui, porque simplesmente o material é fantástico. Vincent, boa noite. How are you, my friend? I'm pretty good, and you? Very good. Right. Say hello to Brazil. Hi, Brazil. How are you guys? <laughs> Sorry for 98. <laughs> uh, Vincent, uh, bonjour, Vincent. I should, I should say bonjour, see? Yeah, J'espère right. que tout va bien pour toi. Mix, yeah. arrête mon français. E se pour... Ne pas avoir de problema, ok? <risos> Merci. Pessoal, eu disse para ele que eu espero bom dia, porque a, ele está na Indonésia, agora lá são sete horas da manhã, ou seja, esse canal faz ao vivo, e eu brinquei com ele em francês, que uh, espero que esteja tudo bem por lá, e que eu vou encerrar o meu francês por aí para eu não cair nenhum problema, ok? So, Vincent... Let me officially introduce you first, okay, for the audience. This is the best part because people always uh, would like to know who we are interviewing. So, pessoal, deixa eu apresentar oficialmente o Vincent para vocês, então, com a devida. O Vincent, pessoal, ele é um biólogo marinho é, graduado pela é, Universidade Francesa de Aquicultura uh, de Montpellier, na França, obviamente, Uh, o Vincent é francês e já mora há muitos anos na Indonésia. Desde 1997, ele está baseado, ele mora na Indonésia, aonde ele montou, obviamente, várias fazendas de corais. Tá? É, ele, ele começou praticamente a, a cultura de uh, uh, criação de uh, corais é, no, no oceano, mesmo no mar. Né? Existem várias fazendas, obviamente, é, em shore, ou seja, na terra. Tá? É, Todo esse início de produção, é, o Vincent vem desenvolvendo novas técnicas de cultivo de acrópolas, então, de reprodução, é, de várias maneiras, né, estudos, sempre em busca de novas espécies. Tá? Uh, e, obviamente, que ele já mergulhou por praticamente todo o planeta, ou toda a Ásia e toda a Indonésia. Né? E ele é fotógrafo subaquático, também apaixonado por imagens. Vocês vão ver muitas fotos bonitas hoje aqui. O Vincent já foi palestrante na Máquina, já foi palestrante no Rifa Palusa, já foi palestrante também no Riffstock, é, na Austrália, esse último que teve agora. É, eu procurei assistir todas as palestras dele, já assisti provavelmente umas 10 vezes. E o Vincent, recentemente, acho que foi ano passado, ele se juntou ao time de uh, Ciência e Desenvolvimento da Triton Applied Reef Bioscience. So, your vast curriculum, everybody knows... Who you are, my friend? Okay. <laughs> well, it's just a hobby, you know. It's just a passion, you know. So yeah. It's just passion, yeah. And uh, Vincent, we'll, I will be translating part of our conversation. So uh, uh, try to have, uh, you know, small sentences, right. and I translate, and we interact with each other, you know. Okay. So uh, first, Vincent, uh, this is just a personal question. How how you started your passion for corals? Okay, well, I mean, I, I was working for a French company, you know, that actually was importing corals and fish, you know, and they sent, uh, I stopped working for them. They sent me in many places in Vietnam, in, in Hong Kong, in Philippines, everywhere around the world. And they sent me in Indonesia to control shipments, you know, to control the quality of shipments. So I was here. And then I saw, you know, the way the operation were running. And, um, and, and, and your saw... passion... And your passion about corals, how, what drove you to uh, well, study I mean, in marine I, biology? I had, I had a reef tank, you know, when, since I was 16 years old. I start with freshwater, obviously, like everyone, you know, I was breeding cichlids, you know, I was, I was very much into Tanganyika cichlids. 
<laughs> then I went to university and uh, I learned a little bit the basic of marine biology. Then I did this uh, marine aquaculture school. And, uh, and, and yeah, and this is where it started, you know, is when I went to university that I started to get uh, more into the coral world. Ok. Pessoal, o Vincent começou com 16 anos de idade, como muitos de vocês, com um aquarinho de água doce, começou com ciclídeos e etc., e foi pegando paixão, resolveu fazer uni a universidade, se formou, e depois foi trabalhar para uma companhia de extração de corais e peixes, e pediram para ele acompanhar os carregamentos que saía da Indonésia. Então, foi assim que tudo começou. Vamos encurtar um pouco, e é uma história muito legal, e vocês vão ver o trabalho que o Vincent faz. Vincent, I'm gonna start here, you know, with the video of something right. about your project you have in Indonesia, no? Okay. Uh, just tell me how many farms you have in Indonesia? Uh, okay, so I need to uh, recount, you know, I mean, uh, we have... At the moment, we have 11 farms. 11 farms. Pessoal, ele tem 11 fazendas de corais na Indonésia. Most of them are located in Bali, uh, nearest to Bali. Most of them, yeah. I mean, uh, like nine of them are in Bali, and then we have three outside Bali. Ok. Ele tem a maioria, a maioria está perto de, de Bali, a, a, o restante está mais nas proximidades de Bali. Bali and is a very special place. Uh, is, Bali, oh, we, are, I, we are very lucky, you know, because if you, if you go in the south of Bali, then it's the Indian Ocean. Then you have big swell, um, upwelling, so cold water, very high minerals water, you know, and a uh, lot of current. And if yeah. you go in the north of Bali, it's calm, turbid. So it's completely different environment, you know. So we are lucky that uh, within three, four hours of driving, we can have many different kind of habitat for corals, you know. So we are very, very lucky here in Bali. Oh, very nice. Ele está num lugar muito privilegiado, ele está dizendo que nesse, se você viaja ao sul de, de Bali, é, pelo que eu entendi, você vai encontrar águas mais frias, águas cristalinas, low, é, nutrientes baixos, muitos minerais, e aonde ele está, a água é turva, e depois vocês vão entender por que, que ele está dizendo isso aí, e mais águas mais protegidas também. Então ele está numa divers, de, biodiversidade muito grande de habitats diferentes dos corais. Amazing, amazing, uh, very nice. So let's put the video first. You can even comment on top of the video and I translate as well to people understand the magnitude of we, what we are talking. Então, pessoal, eu vou colocar aqui um vídeo para vocês sobre a fazenda de corais e uh, vocês vão ver a magnitude do tamanho que nós estamos falando que deve ser só uma fazenda de corais. E, pessoal, hoje vocês vão ter um material didático aqui que o Vincent vai apresentar assim que a gente passar esse vídeo, ok? Então, deixa eu colocar aqui exatamente uh, o, o vídeo de apresentação. Me dá um segundinho só. Just a second. I'm uh, just uh, putting all the windows here. Um... I mean, you, you have to understand that because my background is marine aquaculture, you know, so, so when I came into the coral world, you know, the uh -huh. straight away, you know, I was trying to, okay, we have to stop collecting and we have to start producing, you know, so I always yeah. thought about trying to produce things instead of collecting them. So that's yeah. where it all started. É, isso aí, pessoal, o que ele está uh, falando, é bom vocês entenderem que uh, o trabalho do Vincent é de, de produzir corais, ele não coleta corais, ele não é uma empresa de é, extração é, de corais, né? e sim uh, de produção de corais no ambiente natural. Tá? So, Vincent, people are already seeing your video here, and you can comment. This is oh, yes. one farm, correct? So, that's, that's one farm that is on the east coast of Bali, in Chandidasa. So, mm -hmm. you could see the racks from the ocean. So, we go there at low tide, So this is only when the low tide is very low, you know, so we can go there and we can walk down there. But when the tide is high, there is pretty big waves on top of it. Wow. So this is coral that just got planted. You could see the mother colony just before. Uh -huh. That's some mother yeah. colonies. Então, pessoal, growing. só para vocês entenderem aqui, That's esse right. local, vocês, vocês estão conseguindo ver porque a maré está baixa. Então, 
esses corais ficam numa área pro, é, 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 protegida, né? Imagina que tem uma barreira de recifes de corais, de pedras lá na frente, e aonde a, a, ele, eles a, têm o cultivo dos corais aqui é numa área produzida, é, protegida. Quando baixa a maré e tem tempo bom, eles estão ali fazendo a manutenção em toda a fazenda, né? Ok, Vincent, go ahead, man. So you can see on the left there is racks with mother colony and on the racks this is uh, the, the, the babies, you know. So we take frags, you know, from the mother colonies to plant for the babies, you know. So we, mm -hmm. we attend uh, two farms, you know, one with a mother colony and one with a production. Então, pessoal, eles têm alguns racks desse aqui, como vocês podem ver, que tem as colônias mães e tem outros racks que tem é, a, as mudas, né? Que para nós são colônias também, né? Pelo tamanho. I'm just joking, uh, Vincent, that your uh, babies here, they are colony for us, ok? <laughs> you can, you yeah. can keep sending the babies. Uh, this you size. Know, and the, the funny thing is, is when I bring people down there, you know, I say, ok, you, you know, I mean, we call this mother colony, you know, but I have my real mother colony, you know, then I bring them to the wild colony, which are like three, my three meters, you know, and I say, that's a real mother colony, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it nice. all, all depends on the, where your standards are from. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah nice. that's, that's a colony of uh, Millepora that just got fragged. So mm -hmm. this is uh, one guest, you know, that uh, we get him to frag some few calls. Oh, also anemone. Uh, at that place, you know, there is uh, old racks, you know, that we let it go, you know, and it all got overgrown by, uh, by uh, anemones. So this is one rack that we just let, let it be. So it, the coral overgrown the rack. We cannot move it anymore. So we let it be. And then there is some anemone that came, you know, and now we have a colony of anemones. That's uh, our old racks. So... Uh -huh. Yeah, we just let them let them grow, you know, and uh, after a few years, you know, it just make a, a huge artificial reef. <risos> então, pessoal, eu perguntei ali se ele também cultivava as anemas, ele disse que elas chegaram ali de alguma maneira e aí quando eles viu, elas também tomaram conta daquele rack. Então, ele deixa, né, não, não tem problema nenhum, até porque isso forma um ambiente natural. And this is good because uh, it creates a more natural environment for for the acropolis. I, yeah, I don't I mean, know. It, it's, it's... It's always what I tell people, you know, I mean, we have selected, you know, corals for the aquarium industry, you know, so they're all colorful, you know, when you go to a reef in the ocean, you know, 90% of the corals are brown, you know, so on our artificial reef, you know, I mean, people are, it's really incredible because it's very, very colorful, it's all green, purple, blue, while uh, you go just 100 meters away on the, on the natural reefs, you know, and then it's mostly brown, you know, so it's what I tell them, you know, I mean, you can see, you know, this has been created, you know, by us, you know, because it's all colorful. Mm -hmm. There is no one single reef in the whole lagoon, you know, which is as colorful as this one. <laughs> I, I will yeah. not, give, I will not give a spoiler about brown corals right now, because I will let <laughs> show in the presentation you prepared. And this is going to be much yeah. better for them to understand why the brown uh, uh, acroporas. Bom, pessoal, eu estou dizendo para ele que nós não vamos dar nenhum spoiler né, da, das acroporas marrom que ele acabou de falar aqui, porque vocês vão ver na apresentação que ele preparou, né? E, é exatamente sobre isso aí. Mas é ó, isso aqui ele comentou que deixou crescer lá, formou um recife de coral artificial, né? É, é, so this is for 12 years there. Wow, amazing, man. Yes, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I usually I like that colony, you know, because it spawns every year, you know. So I I go and look at the coral spawning every year. That's uh -huh. another one, Acropora robusta. A big you, are, you are kidding. You are, you are kidding. They spawn there in that artificial place that you created. Yes. Wow. They spawn every year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a big colony, you know. I mean, that one that one is probably like three meters by three meters, you know. So it's it's a big colony. Wow. Pessoal, ele está dizendo que esse recifezinho artificial que eles criaram ali, todo ano essas acrópolas desovam nesse local. Olha que coisa mais incrível isso. E, e é, uma, é uma coisa inacreditável, né? Ela está num ambiente diferente, em muitos casos, de que, uh, desses corais aí, e elas desovam aí pela qualidade da vida. So, and, and, and Vincent, they spawn there. Uh, um, because they have a very good quality of water and, and, 
and uh, the natural habitat probably is that the reason yeah, they are just in their natural habitat you know so they just behave like uh, like like they would you know i mean it's just it's just the way acropora behave so you can see you know this reef is all purple green blue you know there is no such a thing in the uh, in the natural environment is there is no such a thing uh -huh. in the in the natural reefs Okay, uh, Vincent, one question. I saw it at the beginning of the video here. Let me come back here just for a second. The, you are giving classes or this is kind of a workshop for yes. Acropora or visitors? You yes. receive visitors there in your not farm? Because, because we, we not only do, uh, I mean, I, I, we created three years ago a foundation, you know, because we have a problem, you know, in our industry, you know, it's coming under yes. a lot of attack and a lot of pressure. And for two years, we, uh -huh. that was a good example of it. You know, we, we could feel it coming, you know, they could, we could feel it coming, you know. So we created a, a, a non-governmental organization, a foundation, you know, where we, we promote uh, coral reef restoration and education. So, uh, so we teach, we give class courses, you know, on, uh, on uh, corals and on, um, on uh, reef restoration and creating nurseries and uh, and everything we collect data we monitor the reef that we we are restoring so 10% of everything we produce for acropora needs to be they call this restocking you know it needs to be replanted in the ocean you know so we have multiple oh. programs where we replant corals on the reefs and we restore hey, this is reefs. important to translate então pessoal é, vocês sabem que a Indonésia teve um problema muito sério Teve um problema de pressão de distração de coral e a Indonésia ficou fechado por quase... Almost two years, a Indonésia was closed? What, one year? Yes. Two yeah. years. Two years. E, e dois anos ficou fechado e uh, foi criado, então, uma organização é, sem fins lucrativos pelo, pelo Vincent e outros também, pessoas de lá da Indonésia. E uh, eles resolveram, obviamente, dar conscientização, dar aulas de preservação e etc., é, para as pessoas que moram lá ou para pessoas de fora, inclusive. Então, se você pensa em visitar a Indonésia, você pode falar com o Vincent lá para ir visitar a fazenda de corais, tá? E isso é sensacional, né? Uh, we will talk later uh, uh, as well about uh, what, what the future brings, probably, from Indonesia, because all the worries worry about it. We want to preserve uh, our nature. And your... Uh, 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 you know, initiative here, initiative here is, is amazing, Vincent. Pessoal, só uma coisa que eu esqueci de traduzir é que 10% oh, wow. de todo, todo esse coral que é produzido pela fazenda retorna para o seu habitat natural. Ele, ele faz o repovoamento com esses corais. Esses corais nem saem de dentro da água, então eles não são reclimatados ou coisa desse tipo. Just explain a little bit more how you return this 10% back to the reef. So, I mean, it only depends. So that's why uh, in our ocean gardener programs, you know, we use many different technology. You know, I mean, the, 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 the technique that we use for aquarium industry production, you know, is mainly racks like this, you know. So there is one place in North East Bali where we use racks for reef restoration also, you know. But uh, in some places I use ropes. In some places I make trees in uh, vertical. Mm -hmm. And in some places, I focus on uh, micro fragmentation, you know, so we cut very small pieces of coral and then we glue on lines. So, so I, I, I created many different techniques, some that I use from other people and some that I use myself, uh, like soft corals, for example, we created the, the techniques to plant soft corals. So we plant a lot of soft corals. So I have one site which is dedicated to soft corals. Wow. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and then uh, we teach, we bring the, the guests, you know, to all the different sites and we teach them the different techniques. The problem wow. we okay. had is two years ago when we, when we got banned and we tried to argue with the, with the government, you know, is that uh, for many, many years uh, we got lazy and, uh, and, and the, the corals that were supposed to be restocked, replanted, we gave away to other entities. NGO, you know, that uh, were collecting money from hotels and everything, and they were getting corals from us, planting wow. the corals. And then after, when we, we needed the data, you know, we needed argument, you know, to discuss with the government. Look, you know, I mean, uh, coral myoculture is also good for the environment. They refuse to give us any data or they refuse to give us any feedback. So we tell them, well, if you play this game, you know, now we stop giving you anything. 
and uh, and we're gonna do it ourselves. So that's why that's one of the reasons why we start doing it ourselves. You know, so re we restock the reef. We are we have we produce the corals and we have the knowledge or how to grow the corals. You know, so we have much more we have much more experience than them. You know, in doing reef restoration. So that's why it's yeah. better we do it ourselves. It's just a lot of work, that's all. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Pessoal, só para vocês terem uma ideia, esse pessoal, o que eles fazem? Eles têm várias estratégias lá, tá? De Eles usam esses hacks aí para povoar os lugares novos, ou ele cria aquelas as árvores com todas as acrópolas. Ele tem um lugar que é focado em LPS lá, em, em Coral Soft. Então, assim, é uma biodiversidade gigantesca esse lugar aí, né? Como, como vocês podem ver. E, como os 10% que eles têm que restaurar né, o, o, os locais, eles praticamente gastam tudo o que eles ganham também é, com isso aí. Então, tem muita doação que é feita para esse programa lá poder se pagar, porque é mais caro quase é, 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 repovoar do que criar esses corais, porque leva muito tempo, né? Great. Ok. Uh, just let me stop here. And I have more two questions, and we're going to jump into the presentation, ok? Question from people that very, are very well respected in Brazil, and I ask them to send some questions for, for, for you, okay? Okay, so first question. How intense is the wide coral collection nowadays in the Indo-Pacific? Is there any perspective for aquaculture corals supplying the entire marine aquarium industry? This question is coming from uh, Dr. Miguel Mies. He's one of the most respected biologists in Brazil. Just let me translate that. Pessoal, Dr. Miguel Mies tá, colocou uma pergunta aqui. É, quão intenso é a coleta de corais hoje é, no, no, no Indo-Pacífico? E se tem alguma perspectiva para a indústria de aquicultura de corais é, suprir toda a demanda da indústria de aquarismo? Ok, Vincent. Sorry. Ok, so... so... Two years ago, we decided to uh, separate ourselves from the wild collection, you know. So we gave away our uh, wild quota, we gave away our uh, wild collection, and we created one association of only coral farmers. Because before, we were in the same association, you know, with the wild collectors in Indonesia. Uh, for us, you know, wild collection is, is, is unfair competition. Because they just wow. go there, collect and sell in high price where we take all the risk. You know, we have to invest money. We put so much money in the bottom of the ocean. And if there is a tsunami, a, a huge storm or a bleaching, you know, we can lose everything. You know? So we take all the risk. Yeah. And let, because let the white collection parts. keep the price low. Okay, let me translate by parts here. Uh, pessoal, na realidade... É importante entender que os, uh, as fazendas de, de corais se desligaram é, completamente da a coleta selvagem de corais na Indonésia. Tá? Hoje ele acha, inclusive, que isso é uma, um conflito de interesses. Né? E eu também concordo. Né? E uh, uh, o, o, quem extrai o coral, é, obviamente, que trabalha com altos preços e etc., né? É um unfair competition, segundo ele, inclusive, né? uma competição é, é desleal. Né? Então, é, tem que separar um pouquinho as coisas, porque é, eles têm que investir dinheiro nas pessoas, nos racks, em toda a tecnologia, e o pessoal que coleta praticamente não existe muita coisa. Ok, Vincent, sorry to interrupt. One of the best examples is, uh, is uh, until Australia started to ship wild acropora, nobody would ask for big colony or anything they we got the market used to it to receive normal colony then australia starts shipping and because they were shipping white coral much bigger size and everything people start to ask us again you know oh we want wild acropora we want uh, this you know so it's it's just offer and demand you know if the offer is only my culture coral people get used to my culture coral and only buy a my culture and they are very satisfied you know with my culture corals So, Great. so for me, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm against uh, wild collection, you know, because uh, also, you know, the wild collection, they say, you know, that they, they collect few, you know, it's true, you know, they collect few, you know, but in places where they collect the same strain, the same color of animal, and they just take them all, so yeah. they don't take everything, but of one particular genetic pool, they just remove them all. Yeah. So, like, if you take acanthophilia, for example, you know, okay, so if you go in a site which is collected for acanthophilia, you will find only the brown ones. All the wow. colored ones, all the red ones are gone. 
Então, It's pessoal... Good to remove this, this genetic pool. Yeah. O que ele está dizendo é, 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 é o seguinte, que é, ele é contra a coleta selvagem e que antes, antes da Austrália abrir para a uh, exportação de grandes colônias e corais selvagens, é, todo mundo queria as colônias maiores da Indonésia. E hoje já se tem uma procura muito forte de corais de fazenda. Então esse mercado só está crescendo cada vez mais. E o caminho, so you believe the way is that, uh, uh, you know, the farm, farm market of corals is going to be bigger and bigger? Well, if, if they shut down the wild, yes. Yeah, the only reason why the my culture is not moving forward is because we have to compete with people that, that get the call for free, you know? Sim, e so... ele, também disse, ele também disse, pessoal, que tem é, algumas, obviamente, espécies né, de acantofilia, por exemplo, que hoje você só encontra marrom, as coloridas você já não acha mais, né? So, so that's that. That's one thing. I think you know. I mean, uh, the mariculture and the culture of coral is just as is just born. You know, I mean, we haven't touched you know the sexual reproduction. So when we can produce acantophilia with sexual reproduction, if the price is right, if it worth ah. it. Yeah, ele está dizendo que ele pode. Viable, you know, if it's yeah. financially viable, we can breed them. Ele ele está dizendo que consegue inclusive é, reproduzir acantofilias é, em, é, nas fazendas dele. Só que o preço ainda sai mais caro do que coletar. Então isso aí ainda é um, uma barreira, né? This is the same about a fish aquaculture as well. You know? It's just a matter of calculation and the price. No, it's it's basically that's the barrier today, you know? We haven't touched. I mean, we're just starting to do micro fragmentation, you know, in the in the offshore, you know, and we do micro fragmentation inshore. And we're just starting to do micro fragmentation offshore, you know, but for some species, it works very, very well. And we just have, have, have started. So, so I think there is still a, a huge potential for my culture. And we just, right now, we do, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. And the reason why we cannot go deeper is because there is still wild collection. After you have another issue. The okay. other issue is like in Australia, they get typhoon. Hurricane, typhoons. So on the Great Barrier Reef, they don't have the right locations to actually do my culture the way we do it here in Indonesia. É, ele, eles estão fazendo hoje, pessoal, microfragmentação na, nas fazendas, né? Ou dentro da água, tá? É, já se faz fragmentação, obviamente, é, no, nos aquários, nas baterias, mas algumas acrópolas que são mais selvagens estão indo muito bem em micro, microfragmentação, né? E teve uma parte que eu não entendi, que ele me falou da, também da Austrália, mas uh, é muito importante saber que esse market está crescendo. Do you believe that, that the, the, uh, uh, the farmer market of corals uh, can supply the entire market in the world, uh, uh, in the future? Well, I mean, if we stop, I mean, right now, you know, if we just do asexual reproduction, you know, just by fragmentation, you know, if we start yeah. to do sexual reproduction, you know, properly, you know, Yeah, we could we could produce, you know, millions of acantophilia, millions. Wow. Então, pessoal, just, ele tá just we, que... we need to make the investment, you know. I need I need two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars to set up a hatchery for calls. Wow. Ele está dizendo, pessoal, que sim, que se, por exemplo, se a coleta é, selvagem for é, proibida ou reduzida, né, é, ou muito mais controlada e tiver investimento nas fazendas de corais é, e começar a fazer a reprodução uh, sexuada, né? ou seja, que é exatamente a fecundação do ovo uh, com as acrópolas e etc., ele pode fazer isso, aí ele já fez e não é segredo nenhum. So it's not a big secret how to reproduce sexually all these corals, correct? Well, I mean, Jamie Craig, uh, in Ornament Museum in London, you know, last year managed to reproduce Blastomusa, for example. You know? Wow. So Blastomusa uh -huh. Vivida has been described and produced. There is one Japanese guy in Okinawa, you know, that is producing trachyphilia. Yeah, pessoal, tem... It's already tem... happening. It's already happening. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, Jimmy, how is how is his name? Jimmy Craig. Jimmy Craig. Jimmy Craig. Jimmy Craig. Yeah. Uh, He's a Triton guy. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, a Triton guy. I know him. I, I know the name. I was just uh, reminding. É, 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 yeah. já, vocês viram na palestra do Isan? que o Issam mostrou, inclusive, 
é, a, a produção de uma Tênues Blue, inclusive. Ele está falando que até Blostomussa já fizeram, tem uma pessoa no Japão também, então não é um big segredo. Né? É bem, bem possível. Ok, one more question and we go to the presentation. This is a very common question here. Don't get us wrong. It's, it's a stupid question probably for you, but uh, it's, all right. <laughs> it's probably the coral that all of us start. <laughs> people have no idea. It's hard to, uh, to understand, you know, the way it works here, you know, and it's yeah. always why I tell my customer, you know, come here, have a look with your own eyes to see what we're doing. And then after we yeah. talk, and it's, it's always crazy. much easier, you know, once they have seen it. Yeah. Então, pessoal, ele disse que não tem essa de, é, é, pergunta estúpida, é difícil de começar mesmo no, no aquarismo. Vocês estão escutando isso de um biólogo marinho, né? Mas a pergunta é, por que, que a Xenia Pompom não pulsa em todos os corais? E isso eu realmente apresenciei, nunca tive no meu aquário, mas é uma realidade. So, Vincent, why Zinia uh, pulsing not pulse in all aquariums? Have you ever faced any, any explanation for that? Well, I mean, from, from my understanding, you know, uh, uh, the Xenia is pulsing to get rid of uh, toxic material, you know, from the, from the photosynthesis, you know. So, so I think uh, if it's not growing very fast, it doesn't need to pulse. Ah. That's what I understand. Maybe I'm wrong, you know. I mean, I didn't go into... I don't produce Xenia, you know, because I believe Xenia should be produced in Brazil, not here. <laughs> Because, okay. because it's so complicated to ship, it's so sensitive, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's better, you know, you, I leave it to the people in Brazil, you know, to produce it, you know. Yeah. But yeah, the, 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 the explanation that goes with the pulp thing is that uh, uh, a lot of product from the photosynthesis become toxic, you know, and then uh, it produce too much oxygen. So uh, uh, the polyp are pulsing to get more flow and to get rid of this toxin and to flush everything out. So you I think if the, if the Xenia is not growing fast enough, it doesn't need to pulse. Okay. And if it's not growing fast enough, it don't need to pulse. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Então, pessoal, ele entende, que pelo não conhece muito, mas ele disse que a, a Xenia pulsa porque ela tentando se livrar de algumas toxinas que acontecem, que aparecem durante a fotossíntese. E se a Xenia não está pulsando, é porque ela está crescendo. <risos> né? E foi, foi isso que eu entendi aqui. For me, Xenia is a pest. <risos> We know that. <risos> Xenia, I fight it, you know. I spend most of my time, you know, removing, you know, because once it starts to settle, you know, I mean, you, it managed to settle on a small bit of Acropora, a small piece, and then pff, overgrow yeah, and yeah. kill the Acropora, you know. So, exactly. so I get, uh, I remove Xenia all the time. Yeah, I know. Ele está dizendo que a, a Xenia, obviamente, é uma peste, mas é um coral lindo, né? But it's a beautiful coral because it has a it natural is. movement, no? Yeah, yes. and for, and for people beginners, that are you know, starting. it's a great thing. Yeah, and people for that are starting. Have a, it's always why I tell, you know, if you like angelfish, you know, make a tank, you know, full of soft coral and Xenia, you know, and put your angelfish in it, they love it. <laughs> <risos> Ele está dizendo que se você gosta de Xênia, monta, monta um aquário com coral soft e Xênia, com um peixe anjo, que eles vão dar o controle, vão fazer o equilíbrio <risos> correto ali. Thanks, thanks. This is what's great, uh, uh, Vincent. So, let's go to the, to the part of the, uh, the presentation. Yes, I have your presentation here. I'm going to share my screen here. Let, let me know if you can see this gentleman there. Yes. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Let me see if your presentation is showing in, in YouTube right now. We have a delay of about 10 seconds of the stream no from here into the, to the YouTube. We have now 130 people online watching us, okay? Wow. And, yeah. Thank so you, guys. Obrigado. It's a, Probably your biggest audience. I don't know if you <laughs> have done that before, but uh, it's a good audience. Yeah, it's that... usually around 100 people, yeah. <laughs> okay, pessoal, estou dizendo para ele que nós temos hoje já 140, 140, this growing. I need more people. I need to have more people than Isan, you know? So bring it on. <laughs> Isan, Isan, we are having, you know, be better audience than you. Uh, pessoal, nós já temos 140, 140. 
uh, Vincent, right now. Oh, wow. yeah, great. So I'm gonna be, uh, you know, forwarding the slides here. Just let me know if you need to come back or something. Pessoal, eu não vou traduzir alguma coisa, a não ser que eu tenha. Esse material está todo em português já. Ele vai ficar aqui gravado no canal, tá? Então, eu não vou interromper para seguir e vocês vão entender o que está escrito em todos os, os slides aqui. Caso tenha algum tópico que seja bastante interessante aqui, eu vou interromper o Vincent, então ele vai explicar mais. Ok, Vincent, go ahead, man. All right, so, so, so I mean, the and, first thing I need to say, sorry, just, go ahead. Just one, one more thing I'm forgetting here. The title of this presentation is The Brutal Truth About you know, marine corals, okay? <laughs> Go ahead, man. All right. Sorry. So, so where it comes from, you know? I mean, first of all, you know, often people show me picture of coral in their tank and they ask me what it is. And, and, and I realize that for me, it's very hard to actually identify properly, you know, aquarium corals, coral that have been in aquarium for a long time. And um, so they change, you know, their morphology change, their color changes. So it's very hard for me, you know, to actually, you know, identify those calls, you know. So, so I developed over the year, you know, a skill, you know, of, uh, of uh, trying to recognize, you know, okay, that's coral in, in the aquarium after a few years, it becomes very nice. What is the original species it comes from in the ocean? Yeah. So I'm trying to find the original species of the, in the ocean so I can culture it. So Pessoal, I developed the skill, you know. Yeah, yeah this ahead. is important to translate. Somente para yeah. explicar, pessoal, tudo isso começou porque muitas pessoas chegavam até ele com uma foto de um coral, dizendo para ele identificar a espécie. E na maioria das vezes ele não conseguia identificar. E por quê? Tudo isso começou porque a morfologia dos corais muda demais quando sai do habitat natural para o nosso aquário. Então o que ele resolveu fazer? Resolveu mapear todas essas espécies para que se possa entender a diferença do, dos corais no habitat natural com é, é, ele dentro do aquário. So, so yeah, and, and, and my job here is to find coral in the in, in the environment and uh, find the right farm, you know, where they can survive and color well and grow well in in the farm. So I always change environment to them, you know. So I try. I had to find uh, what is the difference between uh, the original place where those coral were collected, the place where we grow them, and the condition in aquariums. And, uh, and this led to this presentation, you know, about the transformation of coral from the ocean to the aquarium. So... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so there is differences, you know, in between the, the environment, you know, in between the ocean and the, and the, and the aquarium. So first of all, the lighting is very different. The flow is very different. Then they, they have a transformation, you know, in the ocean, they feed a lot, you know I mean? So for Acropora, you know, and most of SPS, you know, they estimate that 90% of their need come from uh, uh, those antelae, but, uh, and only 10% come from feeding, you know, but I think it's, I think it's, it's a little bit wrong. And I think it's, it's they, they feed a lot more than uh, what we think. So, because most of their studies, you know, were made in clear water, uh, ocean, you know, reefs in Hawaii or in places like this where the water is clear and there is not so much food. While you came in Indonesia, the reefs are much more dirty and there is a lot of more, much more food in the ocean. So that's the main difference between the ocean, you know. Also, you know, the, the, the unbalance of parameter is different, you know, in aquarium. You know, I think in aquarium, the, the parameter are always the same, you know, I mean, there is the water is always clear. There is some few variation in alkalinity, calcium and magnesium a little bit, which you don't have in the ocean, you know, but at the same time, you know, in the ocean, sometimes you have a storm, you know, so the current is much stronger and depending on the tide, you know, there is always some variations. Sometimes the water is clear, sometimes the water is dirty. When it's raining, you have a lot of silicates in the water, etc., etc. There is so many parameters, there is so wow. many fluctuations in the ocean. And I think the water is more stable in aquariums. Wow, this is very important because people, yes. uh, 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 you know, try to think about that exactly the opposite. No, that uh, the, yeah. the environment in the in the ocean it's much more well, it's stable. It's just the parameters are different. Yeah. You know, the fluctuation of parameter in aquarium it's mainly uh, minerals, calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium that fluctuates nitrates and phosphate a little bit. You know, 
But in the ocean is a lot of physical parameter, you know, such as uh, penetration of light, flow, uh, oxygen content, and depending if it's the rainy season or the dry season, you will have many uh, nutrients in the water. You know? So there, there are many situations. Então, pessoal, o que ele está dizendo aqui é que a, a morfologia do coral muda quando eu tiro ele da natureza e coloco no aquário, porque, na realidade, ele está tentando se adaptar a essa nova condição. Né? Na natureza, existe muito mais variação, turbidez da água, parâmetros de luz, disponibilidade de alimentos, temperatura, variação de maré, variação de estações. No aquário, é basicamente reserva alcalina, cálcio, magnésio e nutrientes. Né? Temperatura ainda a gente já consegue controlar. So, Vincent... Uh, first question here in the middle of your presentation: What is th there's no ideal temperature for the re for an aquarium? Yeah, that, 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 that's that's a good question. You know, that's a very good question. You know, like if you go in Australia, for example, you know, in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef, where most of the corals are coming from, uh, in Mackay, for example, or in Cairns, uh, you will have during winter. You know, right now, the temperature is 20 degrees on the reef. Mm -hmm. And even in some places, you know, all the way down where you find all the Acanthastrea, the Micromusa lordowensis, you know, it's down to 16, 17, wow. 18 degrees. We, we will talk when a little about summer. that. <laughs> yeah, nice. when it's Very summer, nice. it's, it goes all the way up to 26, 27. By 28, they start bleaching. Okay, and, and this is why you wrote here from 22 That's to Australia. 28 and also 33 degrees, degrees Celsius. So it's a, it's a majority of all temperatures over the reef, correct? Yeah, so that's why there is a lot of fluctuation, you know, in temperature, you know, depending on the reef. If you compare here in Indonesia, so most of the time, like this year, you know, from September until about a month ago, I didn't use wetsuit. The water temperature was between 29 and 32 all the way almost for one year from september we got a bit of bleaching obviously you know but but yeah the temperature is higher here than it is in uh, in australia you know so during winter i mean during right now it's a winter you know so we have a bit in the south a bit of upwelling we can get 20 22 degrees you know but it's it's very rare and on some special places you know so, so you it's are... a fluctuate i would say between 24 and 30. so what you are seeing here is that uh, if you have corals from indonesia you can have an aquarium of 27 degrees Celsius naturally. Okay. Me, I keep my tanks at 25. How much? 25. 25, okay. And, okay. and I think 24, 25 is, is, is a good temperature. Why? Because in my experience is, uh, so I, I move corals around, you know, so I have farms in the north of Bali where the water is warmer. And I have farms in the south of Bali where we got upwelling and the water get cooler. So when we move some corals from those farms in the north to the south, they don't survive too long, you know, but for like one month, two months, they color it. They become very nice. And what I find out is corals are more colorful in cooler water. Pessoal, olha só. O que ele está dizendo aqui é que ele mantém o, os aquários dele fora entre 24 e 25 graus. Isso é muito interessante, a discussão sobre temperatura aqui. E, na realidade, o que é, é que a gente deve entender de onde está vindo o nosso coral e saber qual que é exatamente o habitat natural dele. Ele diz que tem corais que ele tira de um lugar e coloca em temperatura mais baixa, que a, a, a coloração fica muito mais bonita ainda do coral. Então, acho que a gente vai abordar bastante essa questão de temperatura e, 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 e condições locais de cada ambiente. Great, great conversation about temperature, uh, Vincent. Oh. Normally, you know, if you look at calcification, you know, actually, you know, I mean, the, the, the best temperature for calcification is around 26 degrees. Uh, so it ah. depends, you know, so some, some system that I want to grow coral fast, I will keep a little bit higher at 26. Some system where I want to color at coral, I would keep at 25. Se você quer ter mais coloração você manteria a temperatura a 24, 25 graus. Se você quer ter mais crescimento, 26 graus. That's amazing information. Yeah. Okay, so, and then after, you know, you have uh, different kind of reefs, you know. I mean, people have this image of reefs, you know, like, um, like, Uh, you see in you see in pictures, you know. So so th that's the problem, you know. Most of the people imagine the reef like they see on those pictures. When you do wide-angle underwater photography, 
you you need very particular conditions. You cannot do every day. You know, you have to wait that the water becomes clear, that there are no waves, and you need a you need perfect condition to do those pictures. So so people have to understand. You know, when the water is clear and you can see very far away, you know, it's actually very rare. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen every day. You know, it's not always like that. It's mm-hmm. actually very seldom like that. So that's one thing. Yeah. O que ele está mostrando aqui, I pessoal, é que os corais, e yeah, os corais se adaptam a diferentes ambientes. Existem corais que vêm de recifes costeiros, de recifes oceânicos, recifes de profundidade, é, baixa profundidade, lagoa recifal, é, cristas recifais, paredões, e um aquário pode representar somente um ambiente, né? E o coral vai ter diferente é, é, adaptação por esses é, diferentes. É, você só vai conseguir ter um tipo de aquário. É isso que ele quer dizer. Ok, Vincent. Yeah, go ahead. So, so you have to understand that uh, most of the corals are actually coming from inshore reefs because they are the closer to the shore, you know. So most of the coral, like, like in Australia, all the LPS, the scolimia, the, 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 the gold torch, all these kind of things, they come from inshore reefs, very inshore. dirty inshore reefs. All the trachyphilia, you don't have 50, you cannot see 50 centimeters, you know, where you find the trachyphilia, you know, for example. In, you know? in shore, so people imagine they come from close to shore, the shore, close to the coast. Close to- Close to the to the to the coast. So yeah, so, okay. so on the Great Barrier Reef, you have to understand. You know, the reef is hundred and I mean between hundred and hundred and seventy kilometers from the shore. Ooh, so okay. you have to travel by boat, you know, full speed for three, four, five hours before you get to the reef. Okay. Yeah. So from the reef, you cannot see the land. Yeah. Hey, pessoal, so, é, é importante dizer que a maioria so, dos so, corais são coletados. É, nos recifes inshore, que são próximos da costa, tá? Então, por exemplo, na barreira de corais na Austrália, você tem que pegar um barco e dirigir 3, 4 horas, navegar de alta velocidade 3, 4 horas para chegar até o recife. Ok. So, the reef, you have some few islands and some few reefs in between, you know? So, the reefs which are in between the coast and the barrier reef are called the inshore reef. And this is where most of the corals are collected. You know, because right. it's not too far. Yeah. And then after you have the offshore reefs, you know. So in front of the Great Barrier Reef, you have the offshore reef. This is where you're gonna have the strawberry shortcake, for example. They're coming mm-hmm. there on the outer reefs in front. And then after inside you have the lagoon, and then after you have the inshore barrier reef, and then after you have the inshore reefs. Perfect. So yeah, so there is many different habitats. Yeah, uh, uh, and eu, you eu tava no slide different. Yeah. Eu estava num slide diferente aqui, pessoal, peço desculpas. Então, na realidade, o que ele está dizendo é que a gente não pode ter é, corais de diferentes res, tipos de recife num aquário só, né? que cada um desses lugares vai ter uma condição diferente. E é o que ele vai explicar. Ok, great. So, the funny thing is that most of the people, you know, they, they try to recreate, you know, the offshore reef, you know, the outer reef, you know, the one which is outside, you know, where the nutrients are the lowest, where the water is the clearest, where you find strawberry shortcake and all the, the very nice acropora from Australia. Mm-hmm. But actually, this is the most difficult environment to, to recreate <laughs> because you need perfect water quality. It's, it's, you need very strong flow. You need very strong light. Everything needs to be perfect. So, so and, and I don't understand. And then after they put some scolimia, they put some blastomusa, some trachyphilia at the bottom, you know, which don't belong to that place at all. <laughs> uh, pessoal, so, tô so that's, that's one funny thing. Yeah, I'm, é, eu tô rindo, pessoal, porque o que ele tá dizendo é o seguinte, que a maioria dos aquaristas tentam reproduzir o ambiente dos corais offshore, que é os que estão afastados, onde a água é clara, onde tem baixíssimos nutrientes, luz alta, Entendeu? E, e que são os corais, em alguns casos, mais bonitos, né? É, e, 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 obviamente, shortcake, ele falou na shortcake, etc., né? na strawberry shortcake famosa, né? E que aí o cara pega e vai lá e coloca uma escolimia, coloca uma blastomussa, e, e esses animais não pertencem a esse ambiente, né? 
Meu caso, né? Vocês conhecem o meu caso. That's my case, Vincent, ok? Just let you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a classic thing, you know? It's a classic thing, you know? I see it every day in all our clients. After, if you are in Indonesia, it's not as bad because the places where you can find, uh, like Millepora Tennis would live in turbid water, you know, would live in, in shallow, turbid, calm water, you know. So mm -hmm. if you put Turbinaya, uh, if you put Acropora Millepora and Acropora Tennis at the top of a reef, you know, and below you put Catalafilia, Blastomusa, and all that, it's not too bad, you know, because they, they belong to the same kind of environment, you know, not the same depth, But the same mm -hmm. kind of environment, it's closer. But strawberry shortcake is really something different. Yeah, yeah. É, o que ele está dizendo é que se fosse, por exemplo, a Ateno e etc., principalmente a Ateno e a Milépora, são de águas turvas na Indonésia. E aí você tenta colocar ela depois numa água extremamente limpa, extremamente uh, 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 com baixíssimos nutrientes, vai dar errado. Né? Ou não vai pegar coloração. Né? A blastomussa, por exemplo, se você colocar é, no, no topo do aquário, até que não vai ter tanto problema, porque ela é de várias profundidades. Mas isso é isso que geralmente acontece. É, é tentar misturar essa diversidade de origem de animais no aquário. Ok, next slide. All right. Case study. So, so, so that's, that's just an example, you know. That's a, I, was a, I was the first the first guy that that found acropora fluorescence and start shipping acropora fluorescence you know so i was collecting it over 20 years ago in indonesia you know so it lives in a particular environment you know it lives in places with very very strong flow so depend on the on the condition you know we can see you know it grows differently you know so so the shape you know that everybody is looking for you know which is flat and thick and usually has the green polyps is wow. actually from the place which is very difficult to to access you know to collect because the the, the 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 flow is very very strong and you have big waves and big flow you know so this and, is only in this kind of environment that they're going to become like that and Vincent, just a question here you made all this study okay and you move it this species of coral to another place that with more flow and so on to test and document all of this wow yes Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, after, you know, I mean, I've been diving all around Bali, you know, from, for, for many, many years. I dive every week. I go diving every week. I go on the farm, you know, so I can see, you know, I mean, it's just, it's not a case study, you know, it's just my experience. Wow. Uh, uh, I wish, I wish I had time to collect data on this, you know, but yeah. So basically that's, that's what is happening. You know, you can see the picture on the, on the, on the top left corner, you know, that's a classic uh, shape of acropora fluorescence. Then depending wow. on the flow, it's going to take different shapes. So if you reduce the flow, you know, it's going to become a little bit more branching. And uh, if uh, there is a lot of surge, you know, it's going to be, th it's going to be thick. If it's, there is not so much surge, it's going to become thin. So it's, the, the shape changes depending on the condition. You know, the light is always, it always lives in shallow water, you know. So it's, all, it's always between four and 10 meters deep, you know, so. So it's not about the light. It's mainly because of the flow and the type of flow, you know. So very strong uh -huh. flow and very strong surge. Pessoal, então aqui, ó, essa é um exemplo de uma documentação que ele fez ao longo de todo esse tempo da Acropora eflorescensis, tá? É, e a foto de cima à esquerda é o habitat original dela, é, que geralmente se encontra esse tipo de Acropora. Ele pegou, eles pegaram e movimentaram essa Acropora para um lugar que tinha, em vez de ser um fluxo forte, ondas forte, luz média e forte, para um fluxo médio, boas ondas menos, mas iluminação forte. Já mudou a morfologia da crópora, né? Embaixo à esquerda, fluxo forte, não tem onda nenhuma e uma luz média e forte. E no lado direito, fluxo médio e luz muito forte. Essa é a razão, então, que a gente encontra uma crópora de um jeito no aquário, uma crópora do jeito de outro. So, this happens also between reef aquariums, You take one acropora from one exactly. aquarium and move to another one, and you have a different behaviors, correct? Exactly. If you take acropora fluorescence and you a nice plating one, and you don't give it enough flow, and you don't give it uh, and you give it too much light, then uh, it's going to change shape. You know, it's going to become branching and uh, and thin, and uh, you're not going to keep the shape. Mm -hmm. Wow! Excellent. Okay, let's move on. Yes. So this is the meat of uh, of the crystal water. 
So this is what we what we discussed about it. Uh, we, we just discussed about it uh, just a yeah. few minutes ago. You know, I mean, it's like uh, uh, most of the Indonesian reef and most of the places where the Australian corals are collected, you know, they come from Turbid and beyond. Uh, every it's time me, I'm looking for, I'm go looking ahead, for ahead. special corals. I like to go and dive turbid environment. So, so if I go into new places, you know, and I ask, okay, where they have ni- you have nice corals, you know, so people tend to bring me, you know, in places, you know, offshore, you know, with, <laughs> with clean water, you know, and this and that. And no, 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 I don't want to go there. I want to go inshore, you know, I want to go in the bay, you know, where you don't have, you have one meter visibility, you know. That's, that's where I'm going to find some interesting things. Okay. So okay, that's why, you know, I mean, I... Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, o que ele está dizendo aqui é que 90% dos recifes é, é de visibilidade menor que 13 metros. Ou seja, ele está falando há muito tempo aqui de água mais turva. Né? E que os recifes do Havaí e o atol de uh, Qualergian é, são, não são referência para isso aí. Tá? E quando levam ele num, num lugar novo para descobrir uma espécie nova, etc., o pessoal tende a levar ele onde está a água cristalina. E eles, não, não, aí não, eu quero ir aonde a água é turva, porque lá vão estar as melhores espécies, as espécies mais resistentes, inclusive. Sorry. Yeah. That, 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 that the thing, you know, is that I think, you know, the, the corals from turbid water, you know, they are more colorful, you know, they are, uh, they are used to more filtration, you know, in the water, you know, so they, they, they become better aquarium corals. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and and yeah, so that's why this is where you find all the rare, unique, special species, you know, like the echinophilia, the blastomusa, the scolimia, the euphilia, the torches, etc., etc., you know. So this is where, this is the kind of reef I like to dive, you know, and I don't like to dive uh, places where all the divers go, you know, because they want <laughs> to see fish, I want to see corals, so I go to different places and, and every time I can. I'm used to dive in dirty water, you know, this is where I find the, the, the best calls. É, excelente. Ok, Vincent, we can advance to the next slide. Oops, yeah, sorry. Ok, so, so, so this is uh, one thing, you know, that I want to, to say before, you know, is that dirty water doesn't mean high nitrates, high phosphates. Ah. It needs perfectly quality water. It needs low nitrate, low phosphate, good alkalinity, good magnesium, good calcium, all the trace elements, everything. Perfect quality water, just with more food. Então, pessoal, that's, isso aqui so, é importante. That, that's what dirty water means, you know. It doesn't mean, yeah. you know, dirty water, you know, in the sense of, of more nitrates and phosphate. It means clean water with more food. O que ele está dizendo aqui, pessoal, é que água turva não quer dizer que tem altos nutrientes. Quer dizer que, nesse caso, é a condição perfeita pra, com uma, uma, é, uma grande oferta de alimentação para os corais. Né? Não dá para confundir baixíssimos nutrientes, água clara com, com uh, uh, altos nutrientes e água suja. Tá? Mas é a disponibilidade de... So, is the, the, uh, uh, is the, the diversity of uh, food uh, uh, for the corals, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the future of coral reef, you know, will be will reside in the in the management of uh, of waste, you know, and it has always been the the key, you know. I mean, getting better skimmer, you know, to remove, you know, the waste, and and so so the secret is to keep perfect water quality while still being able to feed your corals. So my experience is that uh, in my farm here, my inland farm is is LPS never get better when you have to dose nitrates. When you start dosing nitrates, you know, this is where they look the best. Wow. É, pessoal, ele está so dizendo when que... when you get so low nitrates that you need to dose nitrates, so you have perfect water quality and then you, you have no nitrates at all, you know, you have to dose a bit of nitrates to get to 2, 3 ppm, <laughs> and then this is where they look the best. So... Whatever, uh, SPS or LPS. O que ele está dizendo, pessoal, que o melhor dos mundos, que ele está ele dizendo que o futuro, inclusive, do aquarismo, vai ser só controle de nutrientes. E o resto, nós vamos conseguir dominar de uma maneira muito fácil. E que, para ele, a condição ideal, as melhores cores, inclusive, melhor saúde para os corais, é um, é um ambiente que está zerado de nitrato e fosfato e ele dosa nitrato. 3 ppm, 3 ppm, how, how much of phosphate will be ideal for that case? Well, I mean, 
uh, 0.001, that would be good. Uh, yeah, as low as possible, you know. Zero, I mean, zero, I think two? the next level is when we will need to dose phosphates, that's that the ultimate target, you know. The, the, the first target for you is to start to dose nitrates, and the uh -huh. ultimate target is to also dose phosphates. Okay. So if you start dosing phosphate and nitrates, that means you really have perfect water quality. Ele diz que quando você está dosando nitrato e fosfato, é porque você tem a qualidade ideal de água. And you mean 002 would be, would be good? Uh, 0.001. That's wow. what I target. You know, very, very, very... <laughs> That's very low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But then, then if you have very low phosphate, you can afford to have very low nitrates. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Pessoal, so that's é... what I target, you know, 0.001 phosphate and 2 two, two milligrams of nitrates. That's for me the sweet spot. 2 ppm, you mean? 2 ppm? Yes. Ok. Of nitrates. 1, 2, it's good. É, yeah. é, o, o nível que ele, que ele, que ele uh, uh, encontra na natureza é muito baixo. 0,005 é o que ele está dizendo aqui. And that's why I like the Triton method, you know, because the Triton method is the easiest way. It's not the only way. It's the easiest way to reach. Okay. That, this that is a method, question you know, that I will... Yeah. This, uh, actually, this is a question. Uh, do you use Triton method in your, your tank there? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. I have Refugion big system. And, I, know I'm, uh, I'm, I have my two years old, you know, wild coral stocking system, you know, that I'm transforming into a, a farm system, you know, so I'm connecting mm -hmm. everything, you know, so I'm making, I'm making a, a huge Triton method system. It's going to be 10,000 liters. Pessoal, ele I usa mesmo do Triton. Liter. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's going to be more. It's going to be, I have a 5,000 liter farm, you know, running on Triton method, and now I'm building a 15,000 liter, you know, farm, you know, running also in uh, wow. Triton method. Ele, ele tem dois aquários gigantes lá, pessoal, e, e rodando o método Triton. É aonde vem, é, ele tem um separado para as acrópolas selvagens e outro para as outras, outros corais. So, buff with Triton method, uh, with refuge as well? Refugium? Yes. So, it's wow. all about pipe section, you know, it's just you need big pipes. Yeah. To get yeah. the flu, to get the 10 times turnover, you know, you just need big pipes. Yeah. That's all. Big. Great. Excellent. Okay, so we have a video here, correct? This is a typical habitat. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was, I was going to say something about these slides, you know, the one before, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can come back a little bit, you know, sure. just quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. Yes. That's the one, you know, so, 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 yeah, so most of the coral, they come from turbid habitat. The thing is this, you know, is that if you, when, when I find that species of, uh, of Acropora latistella, the one on the, on the top, you know, for example, mm -hmm. is, we yeah. call it uh, the Bali short cake. If you, yeah. if you look in the environment, you know, the red is not that red, you know, I mean, most of the coral that come, especially most of the SPS that come from turbid environment, they tend to get to look even better in aquarium. Wow. So, so if you look at the red color, you know, it's, it's just pinkish in the ocean, you know, but when you put it in aquarium, you know, it becomes red. The, the, big, the best example is red dragon. Uh, it's, 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 it's brown in the ocean. It's literally <laughs> brown in the ocean, you know. You can just see a little bit of pinkish, you know, pigments, you uh -huh. know, from the zoos and pili, you know, it's, 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 it's very subtle. And then you put it in aquarium and then it becomes purple. Into, so into, that's, good, that's, yeah. that's what I like about corals from turbid environment. From turbid. They actually adapt very well to aquarium and, and look better in aquarium than they look in the ocean. Então, pessoal, a, a dica do Vincent aqui é se escolher corais que são originários de água turva, porque eles, eles vão se parecer muito melhor dentro do aquário e são mais fáceis também. Nesse caso, da, é, se chama a shortcake de Bali, né? Bali shortcake é a latistela, né? É, na, na natureza, no habitat natural, ela nem parece com vermelho ali. Outro exemplo é a Red Dragon. A Red Dragon é um, é um marronzaço né? e, e, na natureza e se transforma, fica com uma cor intensa depois. Né? Então, optem por corais que têm origem é, de águas turvas. E aí vocês vão ver exatamente essas espécies aqui hoje, 
né? E vocês vão saber. É, é, just one more point here that is very important, Vincent. Many people come to me and also and try to uh, ask me about the coral species, uh, you know, with popular names. The first thing that I recommend them to forget about the popular name, trying to find uh, the scientific name. After that, we are going to have, you know, some information useful. Otherwise, it, it's difficult, well, no? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm European, you know, so so um, we don't use common name, you know, in Europe, you know, we use scientific names, you know, mm -hmm. so for me, I have to use common name, you know, in order to sell yeah. the calls, you know, otherwise people don't know what, what we're talking about, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I prefer to use scientific names. Então, pessoal, uma coisa que acontece, o pessoal muito vem me pergunta também sobre como tocar determinado tipo de acrópora, né, e com o um nome popular, né, e, e o nome popular não te leva a nada, se vo, vo, procurem descobrir o nome científico né, do, de cada coral, é, identificar ele, aí você vai achar mais informações para ele. E o Vincent concorda com tudo isso também. Ok, can I advance? Yep. So, one last thing, you know, regarding okay. these this slides, is that uh, I always tell, you know, I mean, strawberry shortcake is difficult to maintain, you know, so, so, so usually when you buy a strawberry shortcake, it's very colorful, and mm -hmm. it only goes down in your aquarium, you know, it gets the color just fade away. I'm, if you I'm take, you know, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, it takes, unless your aquarium is running very well, you can keep yeah. them, you know, but even though, you know, I mean, the, the nicest strawberry shortcake that I have seen in aquarium is ugly compared to what it looks like in the ocean. Yeah. In the ocean, it's crazy. You know, you can see them for fucking 20 meters. You know, they are so <laughs> beautiful and so colorful and glowing. While in aquarium, you know, they get good, you know, but they don't get as good as in the ocean. When mm -hmm. you talk about turbid water calls, they get better than in the ocean. You know, so I always tell people it's better to take a brown corals, put it in your tank, get it colorful, than to take a colorful coral and get it brown in your tank. Yeah. Pessoal, o que ele está dizendo é que, por exemplo, a acrópora shortcake é uma acrópora muito difícil de tocar, segundo a, a, a experiência dele, né? Muitas vezes ele vê, uh, o pessoal coloca shortcake e vai, vai sempre na escada abaixo, né? E, e por suas razões, porque ela é de um, um habitat muito hostil, né? Acho que depois nessa apresentação aqui tem uma parte sobre isso aí. Então, muito importante escolher sobre é, é, o tipo é, exatamente é, para se colocar no seu aquário. E segundo o Vincent aqui, a, os corais que vêm de água turva. Ok, can I run the video here? Yes, please. So, so uh, I put those videos, you know, just to show people, you know, that uh, what a dirty a place with a lot of food, you know, looks like. That's what a reef looks like, you know, most of the time, you know, you can see the water is not really clear, you know, but you can see all the corals are very well open. Yeah, very interesting. It, it's, uh, so, uh, pessoal, como vocês podem ver, as acrópolis no seu ambiente natural tem pouca coloração, a maioria dos corais são marrons. Tudo acontece, essa mágica acontece, que ela vai para um ambiente que está mais controlado, entre aspas, como ele falou antes, e se tem essa morfologia e as cores aparecem, né? E que os corais de água turva representam muito bem. So th this is in Indonesia, this video? Yes, yes, all the places in Indonesia. You can see this, that's Acropora valencianesi, for example, the last slide, you can see the quantity of fish, you know? So those ah, fish, yeah. you know, they go out at night and they feed and then they come back and then they put the excrement back in the, in, in the coral. Uh -huh. So, so this coral doesn't receive so much light, you know, but it receives so much food. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I will take the time here to ask you one question here. Is what is the best food for a cropora in a reef tank? Okay, so the part, that, that's, that's the main problem, you know, is that the best food for a cropora is actually phytoplankton. Phytoplankton. And, uh, yeah, it's... Unfortunately, you know, most of the acropora, they feed on phytoplankton. And unfortunately, phytoplankton is, is the most polluting uh, food you can find, you know, in your tank, you know, because you cannot target feed, you know, you need to bath the coral into the soup, you know. I mean, you can see, especially like Millepora and Tenuis, they like to 
They like to make plate, you know, in very shallow water, in one meter of water. And often when you go diving, you know, you can see, you know, that the first 50 centimeters of the ocean, you know, is actually very dirty, you know. So you are, like, if you're snorkeling, you know, you're into it, you cannot see nothing, you know. Then you put your head down, you know, 50 centimeters, and then the water becomes clear. Well, wow. the millepora, they like to bath in this phytoplankton bloom, you know, all the time. And this is where they're feeding. So, yeah. so, so feeding phytoplankton in an aquarium, is a problem it's 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 not technically achievable you know and you're gonna ruin your tank you know can, can okay, you can so, you can you repeat that part why is is a problem with phytoplankton i couldn't understand because because you need to bath the coral so you need to put a large quantity of phytoplankton you know ah, okay. and, and only only few percent of it is going to go into the corals if you feed pellets to lps you can stick the pellet directly on the corals and all the pellet that you give is going to go straight away into the corals. While in, with phytoplankton, you cannot stick the phytoplankton directly into the mouth of the polyp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need to bath it, and then there is a lot of wastage that's going to so, go in your okay. filter and it's going to destroy yeah, your yeah. water quality. Yeah. Pessoal, a resposta é que a melhor comida para é, as acróporas é o phytoplankton. É, porém, Jogar fitoplâncton dentro do aquário é um problema. Por quê? Porque se você joga fitoplâncton ou qualquer outra comida na boca do LPS, você vê que ele vai absorver ali. E dentro do aquário, ele vai absorver muito pouco. E aquilo ali é uma sujeira gigante para o aquário. É... E vai subir seus níveis de, uh, de, de, de nutrientes. Então, realmente é uma coisa complicada. I also tried uh, uh, Arte uh, Artemis eggs as well. And, uh, you know, It's fine, but uh, you, you need I mean, to... I reefoids works a bit. Reefoids works Reefoid. a bit, you know, but they cannot catch that many reefoids. Uh, me, what, I, what I, I never tried, you know, but I, what I would try, you know, is like you have one company in Portugal called Easy Reef. They make those uh, phytoplankton things. And yeah. uh, just with a turkey blaster, you know, just... But you have to be very careful, you know, just put a little bit, you know, inside the coral when the, the polyps are open, you know, and don't do this too often, you know, it's like, okay, once a week, it's, it's enough. Okay. But uh, at the same time, it depends on what you want to achieve, you know, I mean, yeah. if, if I want to, to, to sexually breed Acropora, I need to feed them, you know, because they will never get enough energy, you know, from lights to produce eggs. They need Perfect. more than that. But yeah. if you just want to grow them and keep them colorful and you don't want to grow them super fast, you don't need to feed them too much. Ok. Pessoal, a dica dele aqui, ele falou que Reefroids é bom, é uma comida interessante. Tem uma outra empresa chamada é, Easy Reef, uh, que produz um fitoplankton bem utilizável, mas não adianta. Uma vez por semana é o suficiente e depende do que você quer também. Se você quer a coloração e não quer que ela cresça muito, não tem problema em não alimentar a acrópora, certo? Não, 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 não se tem problema em não alimentar. Ela vai, vai ficar saudável sem alimentação. A uh, acrópora vai encontrar find other ways to survive and, and have the color. Yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, they have other ways, you know. Yeah. But still, a bit of feeding, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's good, you know. Yeah. Okay. So that's another video, you know, from in, in Indonesian reef, you know, with a lot of soft corals. And uh, you can see, you know, the, again, you know, the water is, is, is dirty. And that's, okay. that's, for me, it's considered clean, you know, that's, that's pretty <laughs> clean, you know, that you have 10 meters visibility, you know, that's, that's, that's plenty. Yeah. I'm happy when I have those kind of conditions, you know, and I'm uh -huh. used to much more dirty than that. Great. Uh, take, taking the time here that you are showing... Uh, soft corals. Pessoal, eu vou fazer uma pergunta aqui para ele. Is, oops, exactly here when the letter coral appears, came, come up here. Um, uma, uma pergunta aqui, pessoal, é o seguinte, ó, do Ronaldo, inclusive. Onde é que está aqui? Uh... Yeah, so in places, you know, which are shallow, you know, and receive uh, uh, storms, you know, regularly, you know, the acropora break, you know while the soft coral, you know, they bend. So there is some places, you know, where the flow is high or where there is big wave regularly, you know, then the soft coral will dominate. Okay. The question is, a pergunta é, é, é se tem alguma relação de toxicidade entre grandes colônias de coral leather 
e acrócoras em um aquário, se ele tem alguma opinião sobre isso aí. So the question is, is there any relation of toxicity uh, from big colonies of leather coral to acrócoras in a reef tank? Well, I mean, uh, I think so. Uh, uh, okay, so basically, you know, I mean, uh, soft coral and hard coral, they, they separated themselves six or seven hundred million years ago, you know, so, so, so they were, they had the same ancestor and they separated, you know, uh, wow. in, a, in, in two different lineage, you know, so you have the hexacorallian and the octocorallian, you know, so they have hard coral and soft coral. Hard coral, they are like snail. They bring their house together with them, you know, so they go inside their house. So if they have a problem, the polyp just retract into his skeleton, you know, and it's protected. Soft mm -hmm. coral cannot do that. So they, 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 they had to change and, and, and use a different strategy, you know, and this different strategy is to use chemicals, you know, is a chemical warfare. So it's to use chemical, you know, to, to stop predator from feeding them, to inhib algae from growing on them. So, so, so all their, 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 their weapons are chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. So they produce so many different toxins, you know, that uh, will stop other coral from growing, will stop other coral from, uh, from spawning, will uh, kill algae, will, uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah, so that's one thing for sure. You know, I mean, uh, me, I know, you know, I mean, uh, like Acropora have a particular smell, you know, all the Acropora have the same smell. So if you open one bag of Acropora, you just have to smell, you know, there is one particular smell of Acropora, you know, and so strong smell. So uh, if I'm used to it, you know, I can smell the difference between Sarcophyton and, uh, and Simularia, for example. Wow, wow. Então, they pessoal, é, isso é muito importante. O Vincent está dando uma, uma informação aqui que os corais duros dos softs, o que separam eles são 6 milhões de anos. 6 milhões de anos, você disse, correto? 600 milhões de anos. 6 a 700 milhões de anos. Isso. <risos> Long time ago. É, muito tempo, pessoal. 600 milhões de anos, na realidade. É, e isso faz com que, por exemplo, o... A, a, a acrópora, simplesmente se ela se sente agredida, ela retrai os pólipos e pronto. O coral soft, ele, ele, o que, que ele vai fazer? Ele vai liberar toxina, ele não tem esse tipo de comportamento. E realmente, é, quando se tem esses dois corais no mesmo habitat, tudo pode acontecer. Isso também depende do tamanho. So it depends also of the side of the ladder and the other. Ma, é, é, correct, Vincent? Uh, mas... After, after é, it's, uh, you know what I mean? It's like uh, all the poison. It only depends on the dosage. Ah, exato. É o que o, o é, é, para o remédio ou, ou o veneno só depende a, o que muda é a dose, né? Então sim, né? É, tá respondido muito bem a pergunta. É, o, outra coisa que ele disse, por exemplo, ele consegue identificar a crópora pelo cheiro. A, a crópora tem um determinado cheiro quando você agride ela, tira ela do lugar, ela já começa a soltar um cheiro. Ele consegue distinguir a crópora pelo cheiro, pessoal. Good. I mean, okay. people, people often don't realize, you know, I mean, when, when, I, when I give my course on corals, you know, and when I tell them about the slow war, you know, that actually coral, you know, they compete each other and they fight each other, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's in an aquarium, you know, so if you have a one coral that is going to start to dominate your tank, you know, he's going to try to kill all the other corals yeah. by a way yeah. or another. É, é isso aí, pessoal. O que ele disse é se você tem várias espécies e uma tentando dominar, você tem que tirar, porque senão você vai ter um problema. Tá? Ok, next slide, uh, Vincent. Yes. So, corals can, uh, yes. can re replace the reefs? So, yeah, so, yeah that's, that's, uh, that's a question. typical question, you know, that uh, I'm asked, you know, about... Uh, You know, I mean, you, you see this in, in, in a lot of uh, argument, you know, for the aquarium industry, you know, that uh, the coral that grown into a, from aquarium could be replanted, you know, in the ocean, you know. Me, I have, I have, I have a bit of difficulty, you know, with this uh, argument, you know, because uh, I think the, the condition in the aquarium are so much different than in, the o than in the ocean. So they lose a little bit with the ability, you know, to live in the ocean, you know, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. light, the flow is different, of course, you know, but they lose the ability to catch food, for example, you know, so they, they lose the ability to feed themselves. 
they lose the ability to fight with other corals, you know. So, so it's not guaranteed, you know, that actually, you know, coral, you know, that are grown into aquarium could be replanted directly into the ocean. They would need to be adapted back. What we could do is what they do in Australia, for example, it's what they call assisted evolution, is they breed them and they spawn them, they raise a little bit the, the larvae and then they, they put them back in the ocean, you know. So their offspring, the offspring could be sent back to the ocean. Então, pessoal, a pergunta aqui é se os nossos aquários no futuro vão poder repovoar os oceanos. E o que o Vincent está dizendo aqui é que eles não estão mais adaptados à luz natural dele, que isso ele iria morrer, né? É, então, tem uma série de, de, de pontos aqui que ele está tá, tá justificando isso aí. É, mas que o que nós vamos ajudar e já estamos ajudando é eles serem, na realidade, é, utilizar os ovos e larvas dele para aí sim inseminar os oceanos. Isso já está sendo feito, inclusive, na Austrália. Foi o que ele comentou. Ok, Vincent. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Oh. Yes, so a little bit of a nice picture, you know. So, so yeah. this is what I explained, you know, in these things, you know, is that, uh, is that now we are creating the same way we created the goldfish, you know, from for freshwater, you know, which is not a natural fish. It's not a fish that you find in uh, mm -hmm. in the rivers. It's a fish that has been created by humans. So mm -hmm. two selections. But it's the same thing is happening with corals, you know, we are selecting, you know, special strains of corals, you know, which you don't find in the ocean, you know, and we are modified, we are playing with the corals, you know, so it's always what I say, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like the bones mushroom, you know, the way you see on this picture, you know, they don't exist in the ocean, you know, you can see, you know, some bones coral, some bones mushrooms, you know, with slightly inflated uh, uh, vesicle, but then if they would be like this in the ocean you know they would get eaten you know by a butterfly fish or whatever you know fish will yeah. eat them you know so they cannot afford to be too inflated you know so it's only when left alone without any predator in a particular particular environment protected that they will develop those those strains yeah pessoal é, o que o Vince está mostrando aqui é que no, no o aquarismo marinho é, é, vai, é, principalmente de corais, vai acontecer o que aconteceu com o, o peixinho dourado de água doce, que o peixinho de água, dourado, de água doce não existia na natureza. E toda essa reprodução em cativeiro e etc., foi levando a se chegar a espécies. Você vê as aruanãs, né? Ou como chegou, ah, como, como estão hoje, né? O próprio peixe palhaço, ele né? mostra aqui as diferentes colorações que tem um peixe palhaço. Isso é legal, isso eu acho. É, é, por exemplo, olha aqui as montípuras multicoloridas. Uh, né, os chálices, os, os mush uh, BG, que, é, que tem essas bolhas em cima, né? Isso não existe na natureza. So, uh, Vincent, uh, this, yeah. the, this Montipura multicolored is not real in the, in the real habitat, no? And this mushroom uh, does not exist, correct? Correct. Not as, as not like that, you know, I mean, like uh, uh, you can find, you know, I mean, uh, Sometimes you can find one Montipora with one polyp, you know, of different, uh -huh. and then you cut this small polyp, you know, and then you grow it, you know, and you can have a, a crafted Monty, you know, or something like that, you know, <laughs> but crafted Monty, yeah, it's, 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 it's a typical aquarium coral, you know, it doesn't ex exist in the ocean. And, and how they did that? They microfragment that and, and glue with each, with each other? No, yes, yes. That's the way they microfragment them and they, they stick them together, you know, and uh, all of uh, 50 different pieces, you know, there is one that actually crafted, you know. Wow. É, pessoal, essa montinha por aqui, o que eles fazem é microfragmentação, né? Junta ela e ela aí vai crescendo. E aí é isso aí. Então, muitos delas, ela, ela, ela não, não existe uma espécie disso aí. Mas eles fazem os frags pequenininho, coloca duas cores, ele vai crescendo e se junta e ela cresce. É mais ou menos isso aí. É, é, é. Ali as duas cresceram juntas, né? Na natureza você vê uma outra acrópora, é, desculpa, uma montípora, com um pólipo de outra cor, mas é raro. I mean, after all, like, like the echinophilia, you know, I mean, you find them in the ocean, you know, not as colorful, you know, and it's true that echinophilia, the chalice, is really a coral that do very, very well in aquarium, you know, because it's a coral that live in, a, it's a cryptic coral, you know, it lives in under other corals, it lives in holes, it lives deep, it doesn't receive so much light. It's a weak coral, you know, it's a, yeah. 
if 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 you put it to compete with any other species of coral, it's going to lose. You know, it's it's it, it's not very aggressive. It's not going to sting other corals. It's not going to overgrow the coral, but it can live with very very low light. Yeah. So okay. so that's that's the strength. You know, so if you put it in an, in an aquarium, you know, without any competition, you know, very good light, very good lighting, you know, then it's going to explode you know, and become very beautiful and very colorful, you know. So this is one typical, the chalice is one typical coral that do better in aquarium than in the ocean. Yeah. E, em muitos casos, esses chalices, por exemplo, que vocês estão vendo aqui, multicoloridos, na natureza, no habitat dele, ele é um coralzinho medíocre lá, que não tem, tem competição, tem pouca luz e etc. Mas aí você traz ele para um, um habitat que já está controlado, boa a qualidade de água e etc., né? uh, uh, elementos químicos, aí ele começa a explodir de cores. Então, é isso que acontece, né? E o pessoal vai aprendendo. O Manche BG é algo que também você não acha assim na, na natureza e eles já descobriram a espécie que, que, que incha essas bo as bolhas, etc. E aí a gente tem animais mais bonitos no aquário. Next. Ok. So, yeah, after this is one... Uh is always what I like to remind me, you know, because they say, you know, those colors are not natural or anything, you know. You have to understand, you know, that for Acropora, you know, the tip of the Acropora is always the most colorful part. Why? Mm -hmm. Because those antelae are brown color, you know, that's that's a gold brown algae, you know. So, so as soon as you remove this layer of those antelae, then you only have the pigment of the Acropora. So there is few things, you know, it's because in the tips, this is where calcification happen, and the calcification produce a lot of toxin, which are toxic for those zoosantelae. So the zoosantelae didn't have time to colonize the tip of the acropora, you know, because it's a toxic environment. What, one point here. So the toxicity here, if we don't have a good flow, the coral can harm itself, correct or not? With that toxicity? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, the thing is this, if you don't have a good flow, you know, and you don't have an, a good uh, import and export of uh, toxin, the coral is not going to grow at all. Huh? So, so that's the way I see it, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like if you see colorful tips, it's already that the, the coral is growing, that means it's already healthy. Usually, you know, the coral which are unhealthy, they are all brown because they are not growing. So usually when you have tip, you know, without those antella, that means that mean it's calcifying. If it's calcifying, it's healthy because it will only grow if the environment is good. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 yeah. So, so basically the coral is going to produce pigments to protect the zoosantella and it's going to put, it's going to, the zoosantella is going to, uh, so it's to protect the, the zoosantelle from UV, you know, UVA and UVB. You know? So it just transform the UVA and UVB, you know, in different frequency uh, uh, lights. So so the tip, there is no zoosantelle, and uh, and it has to protect, you know, all the, the, the cells, you know, which are doing the calcification. So it has to produce pigment to actually protect those cells. So because you don't have this layer of brown algae, and because you have those pigments to protect the cells which are calcifying, it's usually the place which is the most colorful. That's why I always say, you know, I mean, a quarter inch, one, cent one and a half centimeter of rag is actually the most colorful part colorful. of the aquifer. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's why it's very popular, you know, fragging, you know, with a cop. Yeah. O, o que ele está mostrando aqui, pessoal, é que a, a, as acróporas, é, um coral que está crescendo é um coral colorido. Por quê? Porque vocês podem notar que os frags, né, as mudas de corais, são sempre as mais coloridas. Por quê? Porque conforme a, a, o, o esqueleto é, que é calcificado vai crescendo, né, é, é, os pigmentos vão sendo produzidos, né, e aí a, a, os pigmentos de cores, obviamente, a, a, até as zoxantelas popularem aquele lugar, né? Então, a zoxantela populando, ela já vai perdendo a cor, esse pigmento, né? Então, é por isso que a acrópora tem que crescer bem para ter bastante cores, né? E é muito comum você ver mudas de um centímetro, né? Um, dois centímetros com coloração maior do que colônias, em muitos casos, né? Então, é mais difícil ter coloração na colônia do que em corais menores. Next slide. Yes. 
Go ahead. Okay, Cardus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, the, the red dragon, you know. So, so it's always what I say, you know, from a brown weed, you know, to a, a purple coral, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a one coral, you know, that uh, we introduced about 10 years ago, you know, into the hobby, you know. And without LED, without LED light, uh, this coral would never been popular, you know, because since we use LED, you know, then red and yellow are the most favorite colors because blue or purple looks gray underwater with LEDs, while red and, and yellow, you know, become very bright under LEDs, you know. So this is part of all those deep water corals that became popular about 10 years ago, you know, when the, the LEDs came in. Uh, it's, it's very common here in Bali, you know, we have large fields, you know, of them, you know, uh, we have football fields of them, you know, and, and I never thought before, you know, that I will actually sell that species, you know, because it's not very colorful, you know, and it's only since we start using LEDs, you know, that it became very popular. And uh, this is uh, one typical thing of, uh, of those deep water coral is that they become better in aquariums. Então, pessoal, aqui um do maior exemplo, né? A, a, a Crópora Cardus, que é a Red Dragon que a gente conhece aí, né? Eles chamam lá de erva daninha, que tem grandes campos nas encostas e ela é dessa cor. Ela é marrom aí. E só foi descoberto que essa Crópora era colorida quando começaram a chegar os LEDs, que aí tem uma iluminação muito mais forte e ela fica com uma cor avermelhada intensa nos aquários, tá? É, só faz um tipo de reprodução. Is just a sexual reproduction? No, no. So, so that, that would be a coral that actually, you know, I mean, concentrate most of its energy into a, a sexual reproduction, you know, because it's it's filled of them, you know. So it's growing, breaking, okay. growing again, breaking, growing again, okay. breaking, you know. So I think, you know, I mean, uh, I consider those big fields, you know, as one colony. Uhum, uhum. É, ele diz que é muito comum, é, cai um pedaço dela e já cresce outro e vai crescendo e etc. Né? É muito comum essa propagação que ela tem, né? Uh... When, when we farm it, you know, it's this one coral that doesn't grow on the base. You know, it's very hard to get it to actually grow on the base. Ah, it's yeah. just one coral that grows vertically, you know, forever. Yeah. It's very difficult to grow in the base. Yeah, I have difficulty very... here as well. Yeah. É um, é, um, é um coral que é muito difícil ele crescer na base. Ele gente, geralmente cresce na vertical, né? É, e eu estava falando para ele que eu tenho um problema aqui com a minha também, tá? Ok. So, I mean, you have to understand, you know, this is one of the strategy of uh, many acropora species, you know. So that's why you have some uh, bacteries and even some algae that actually become parasite and colonize the skeleton, the dead skeleton, you know, and make it weak, you know, so it can break when there is a big wave. And the coral can propagate itself, you know. So it's part of those corals that make big field, you know, just by asexual reproduction. E ele disse que, por sinal, isso tem algumas espécies que tem sempre um tipo ou outro de parasita e que essa reprodução assexuada por causa vem uma onda e quebra, etc. Ela cai é o jeito que elas têm de, de se propagar. Mas são são uh, 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 casos reais de de, uh, de propagação, né? Oh, here another one, the red Ferrari. Red Ferrari, that's another <laughs> name for it. This is very common here. Yeah, it's not yeah. very common, but it's a very desired coral, I would say. Yeah. I understand. I understand because it's one coral that do very well in aquarium, you know? So it's, uh, I wouldn't say easy, you know, because it's still, a, it's still an acropora, you know? But that's one, mm -hmm. I, it's part of the species, you know, that become better, you know, in aquarium, you know? So it, Mm -hmm. the, the better condition you give him, you know, the, the more it's a very rewarding call. You know, if you take care mm -hmm. of it properly, you know, it becomes better and better. So people like it. And under LEDs, you know, it gets red and the yellow, you know, so it's perfect combo under LEDs. I, I have them here in T5 and it's not red like that. Uh, and I used to have LED before, you know, like the radions and the coloration of that specific co coral was better. I, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. It's one coral that do very well on the LEDs, you know. I mean, it's, yeah. there is no doubt about it. And if uh, corais, before when corais. we had an HQI, before when we had HQI, you know, nobody would have bought that coral. <risos> Ele está falando, pessoal, que são duas espécies, por exemplo, que é, uh, até a HQI, é, ninguém tinha esses corais aqui. 
porque era tudo feio, não era bonito nos aquários. Era dessa cor que vocês estão vendo aí, ó. E o, e, o, e o LED trouxe a possibilidade de ter esses corais que se transformaram, obviamente. Very interesting information. Yeah, next slide. Latistella. The Bali shortcake. So that is the, uh, that's, uh, yeah, the Bali shortcake, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty colorful coral in, in aquarium, you know, but uh, I have seen some people, you know, being very, very successful with, uh, with that coral, you know. It's mm -hmm. just uh, one coral that grows very fast. So it's, it's yeah. like a, a, an alkalinity sink. So it just... <laughs> if you want it to be healthy, you know, you need to be really good, you know, with your alkalinity, you know, because it's going to suck it, you know, like... <sighs> So, and, and yeah, but that's, yeah, perfect, perfect combo, you know, red, blue, yellow. It's, yeah. it's, it's a very, very colorful cause, you know, but you need to, you need to give him very good conditions. We need, we need é, bom, pessoal, ele tá falando que a Latistella, que é a famosa Bali Shortcake, é uma acrópora que ela é bonita na natureza e ela fica mais bonita ainda no aquário, né? Você pode ver aí. E que ela cresce muito rápido. Se tiver uma reserva alcalina estável, ela vai chupar a reserva alcalina e vai crescer muito rápido, tá? E, e não é uma, uma acrópora difícil. So, uh, do you recommend Latistella as a, as a acrópora for uh, beginning to medium level, you know, reef tankers? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all those deep water acrópora, you know, I mean, they are, I mean, comparing, compared to strawberry shortcake, you know, I mean, they are a lot easier to to maintain, you know, so, so it's, I wouldn't say beginner, you know, because I don't recommend any acropora for beginner, you know, but for yeah. a beginner SPS, so somebody that has already a bit of experience with SPS and, and, and good mm -hmm. experience with soft coral mm -hmm. and LPS, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 it's a good okay. beginner acropora, you know, and, and it's a good indicator, you know, if your, if your water quality is good or not, you know, so, so you can see straight away, you know, if there is something wrong in your aquarium or not, because it will respond, you know, very fast. How deep you find the uh, Latstella in Indonesia? It's it's a uh, okay. So you find it, you know, the most colorful one are in very shallow water, you know. So they are the same thing as uh, Microclados, Tenuis, Millepora, you know. They are in less than five meters, you know, of uh, wow. of a murky, turbid water. Uh, but you find some Latistella down to uh, 15 meters. Ele está dizendo uh, que a maioria. Millepora... Mm -hmm. While Millepora, for example, you will only find on top, you know, you won't find deeper, you know. Tenuis, you will find all the way to 10 meters, and Microclados will all, all, only be on top. Too. On top. Ele está dizendo que em, em águas rasas, 5 metros, as mais coloridas estão em 5 metros, mas se acha também em 15, que são aí, que não tem tantas cores, etc. Tá? E aí, as que estão no topo, é as Microclados... Uh, Pikachu e etc essas essas outras acrópolis aí Tenuis yeah, no meio disso aí yeah Tenuis in the middle yeah. yeah yeah it's in the middle but if you offer him a lot of light you know I mean he will he will reward you you know with nice coloration okay okay next slide Feneri right, yeah oh, Feneri is a real deep water cause you know I mean this one deep you water. only find it in in below 12 meters, 12 to 20, 25, 30 meters, you know, in very turbid places, you know, so in places where it's very murky, you can see it's sand around that, that colony, you know, so, yeah, so it, yeah. it's, it doesn't need much light, you know, I mean, this one, I would not, I would give a lot of light to Latistella, you know, but to Feneri, you know, I wouldn't give him too much light. So it's a coral to thing, you know, in the sand. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a call to put in the lower part of the, of the, of the tank, yeah. yeah, definitely. Pessoal, essa Feneri, por exemplo, é encontrada a até 25 metros de profundidade, né, que é uma acrópora que adquire uma boas cores também, mas jamais coloca, colocaria em cima, é, no lugar mais baixo das pedras aí, é, é, para se ter no aquário. Microclados... Yeah. Microclados, yeah, so that's one is a uh, Pikachu is the one that needs to be in, uh, in very shallow water. So, mm -hmm. so need shallow water in here, it's going in, in turbid water, what in Australia is going in clear water, but uh, but but very shallow for sure, you know, and a little bit of current, you know. So, if uh, if you are inside the bay, you know, you don't find any, it's only when you are reaching, you know, the, the, the edge of the bay, you know, where it receives a bit of current from wave and, and from the mm -hmm. natural flow, 
that you're going to start to find them, you know. So it needs more current than a mille porate nuis, but uh, needs more light and, and more current. So it's an acropora that you have to put in the top of the rift, then. Yes. Yeah. Yes, então, pessoal, yes, yes. todas essas daqui, it's todas essas espécies... Yeah. In it's cima a plating a copper, you know, so so it needs it needs needs light, need flow, and need food. Yeah, so it's yeah, yeah. it's 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 not okay. an easy one, you know. This this one I wouldn't recommend it to uh, to beginners. Okay, nenhuma dessa daqui ele ele recomendaria para os iniciantes. Exquisita. Exquisita is a, is, is a classic uh, acropora from uh, from shallow water reef. It makes huge stands. So it lives in protected murky bay, you know, so you can see also that's the point, you know, the, the picture on top is what it looks like in the ocean. And mm -hmm. the picture at the bottom, you know, is what it looks like after, after a few years in, in a tank, you know, so it becomes more colorful in a tank. So it's one of those coral that I would grow in the north of Bali in murky bay. And then mm -hmm. I would bring in the south where there is more flow, cooler water for a couple of weeks to color them up so I can sell them. Wow. So, it, yeah. It, And, and how long for transform from that brown to the blue? You said just, just few weeks, just few weeks, weeks. You know, I mean, because if, if yeah, because the environment is so different that uh, the corals need to adapt. You know, it's going to spend a lot of energy trying to adapt, so it's going to color up. But there is only a, a maximum, you know. So is if they, they grow too much after three, four, five, six months, they start dying. Ah, okay. Então, pessoal, isso so é uma área de weeks, you know, so something like two to two to four weeks. De, de três a quatro semanas, de, de dois a é, two, two, four, de dois a quatro semanas, ele coleta, ele pode coletar essa acrópora aí no norte, por exemplo, de Bali, ir para o sul, que é muito mais frio, inclusive, é, o lugar é diferente, e essa acrópora muda desse jeito, é, e aí, obviamente, que ela tem um mercado muito maior. É uma estratégia de transformação da acrópora. Ela usa toda a energia dela para se adaptar ao local e aí ela adquire essa coloração. Olha que coisa mais incrível. Next slide. Oh, tenuis. Now it's my my place. Yeah. So, so I mean, tenuis for me it's a little bit boring, you know, I have to tell you. I know. Because I can everybody everybody is wants tenuis, you know, and uh, and you have to understand that tenuis was popular, you know, when we had uh, metal alive. Uh, because tenuis, you know, would uh, become blue, green, you know, and their metal allied, you know, so blue tenuis, you know, were very, very, were the most popular coral under metal allied. Then we got LEDs, and it's red tenuis, you know, that became popular, you know, but it's still tenuis, you know, so it's still a, it's, so, a, it's, a, it's a coral, for me, tenuis is a perfect acropora, aquarium acropora, you know, that's, that the species, that adapt the best in aquariums. That's why it's very popular, you know, it's, it, because, because it gets better and better in aquariums. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the coloration completely change. Yeah, the coloration change. And, uh, and you have all those color, you know, that are coming out of nowhere, you know, that they, they really don't look like this in the ocean. Mm -hmm. O que o Vicente falou é que a tenuis é a acrópora ideal para os aquaristas, porque... É, principalmente com o advento do LED, ela vai adquirir uma coloração muito boa, é, não muda tanto né, a morfologia dela, né, como, como os galhos crescem, etc. E elas vão viver saudáveis, com, a, com coloração muito boas, e que é uma crópora que ele recomenda para todo mundo ter no aquário. Para ele é um pouco uh, sem graça, né? até porque é uma crópora fácil, ele vai buscar as acrópras difíceis de de se de, de ter manejo, mas é uma cropa que tem um mercado gigantesco e tem uma infinidade de cores. So that's why I mean that's one of the cropa, you know, that's probably the species that I produce the most, you know. So I plant so many, I have I have them on, I have I have five farms, I have them in six different farms. Sorry, I have them in six different farms. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, I have probably three farms that only produce tenuis and millepora, because this is what everybody wants. A, a maioria das fazendas dele tem tem acrópora tenuis por tenuis porque 
obviamente tem um mercado muito grande, né? Foi o que ele comentou. E obviamente que a Emilépora, que é a segunda mais. So, Tenui e Emilépora are the best sellers, probably. Most demanded. Yeah, the most demanded. <laughs> Bon Except that Tenuis is, is very good in aquarium, while Millepora is difficult in aquarium. Yeah, diferente. A Millepora já é, é a Millepora para ele é uma crópora difícil dentro do aquário. Né? Uh, for me, also spatulata, I, I, I have difficulties with spatulata as well. Spatulata I don't know. Spatulata live on top, live on top of of uh, inshore reefs. I mean inshore. the the lagoon side of uh, of the of the great barrier reef you know the inside of the great barrier reef they live on top of the reef so they need a lot of food a lot of flow a lot of light so they need everything on top you know <laughs> so it's of course it's the most difficult you know okay that's probably my problem <laughs> i have i have I'm, I'm probably one of the only farm in indonesia you know that have a spatulata you know because i found green apple spatulata in, in indonesia Okay. So I've been growing spatulata, you know, except that the way it only takes the spatulata shape, you know, only when it, it's grown in a particular, particular environment. So it needs a lot of current. To keep uh, do, do, do you believe, Vincent, that uh, a species, for example, of spatulata from Indonesia, it can be easier than a spatulata yes. from, from yes. uh, uh, Australia? Yeah. Yes. Wow. I mean, all the corals for me, you know, all the corals for me are, are, are stronger in Indonesia, you know, because um, so most of the reefs in Indonesia are shore reefs. So they are like 100 meters, you know, from the shore, you know, yeah. you have to understand, you know, the, the Great Barrier Reef is 100, 170 kilometers from the shore, you know, so the influence mm -hmm. from the shore is lower. So mm -hmm. the, the, the corals in Indonesia, they used to fluctuation, you know, they used, they, we have rainy season, all the rivers are throwing nutrients into the ocean, mm -hmm. you know, so they used to, to, to fluctuation. And because the diversity is higher, they are equipped, you know, with more zoos and tele strains and species, you know, to adapt, you know, so they, they have a faculty, you know, to adapt, you know, a lot higher than the Great Barrier Reef, you know, so that's why, you know, when I'm on the, when I'm on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, and then uh, I go with my friend, you know, Nick from Ultra Coral Australia, mm -hmm. then he sees that the temperature is 28 degrees, he's like, oh my God, oh my God, 28 degrees, they're all going to bleach, they're all going to bleach, and I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about, you know, 28 <laughs> degrees, you know, in Indonesia, you know, they don't care, you it's, know, the it's nothing. they don't care. Uh, <laughs> it's nothing for them, you know, they're used to it, you know, it's, it's easy, you know, so yeah, so I know, I know that the corals from, uh, from Indonesia are stronger than the corals from, from Australia. Uh, it's a fact. Pessoal, it's eu perguntei para ele se ele achava que as, as acrópolas espatulata é, da Indonésia são mais fáceis, e ele sim, claro, porque elas estão acostumadas a, a uma variação muito maior é, do que na Austrália, né? E que quando ele vai, por exemplo, mergulhar lá em, é, na, na Austrália e chega a temperatura de 20, 28 graus, todo mundo fica desesperado já. Não, nós vamos ter branqueamento dos corais e tal. E ele falou porque 28 graus na Indonésia é, é comum, né, para ele. Então, é, realmente, é, segundo ele, os corais da Indonésia são muito mais resistentes nesse caso, né? Nesse caso de, dessas espécies aqui. Ok, next slide. Ok. The moral of the story. Uh, so let me let me get the translation of this, you know, because I don't remember what was the moral of the story. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, better. So that's, that, that's what I say, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's easier, you know, to buy a, a brown acropora and get it colorful, you know, than to buy a crazy colorful acropora that will turn brown, you know. So this is <laughs> always what I recommend people, you know, I mean, try to create, you know, to create aquarium corals, you know, that are actually colorful, you know, instead of uh, buying very colorful acropora and not being able to maintain them. É, então, so, pessoal, so, inter, in, interessante isso aqui. O que ele está dizendo que a moral da história é que mais vale você comprar uma acrópora que está marrom e dar chance para ela se adaptar e você ver o que você consegue extrair ela do que muitos casos você comprar uma acrópora alucinante, cheia de cores, e ela ficar marrom no teu aquário. Eu acho que essa é uma excelente moral da história e dica, né? E é bem interessante isso aí. Very interesting point. 
Now, it's good for the people to challenge them yeah. to get yeah, a I mean, proper. That's, that's mainly for a corpora, you know. I mean, don't expect to buy a, a bronze colimia, you know, and it will turn into a, a master grade, you know. I mean, that, that, that's not going <laughs> to happen, you know. But for a corpora, you know, it's actually, you know, better to buy bronze a corpora and get them to turn colorful, you know, than the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> é, pessoal, que ele disse assim, ó, não, não, não entendo errado, não vai comprar uma escoliminha marrom e achar que ela vai ficar colorida, não é isso, mas no caso as acrópolas sim, né? Uh, because, Vincent, it's, uh, it, it's a good challenge for the reef tanker that even is learning about acrópolas, getting a bro acrópola and make them colorful, não? Listen, you know, I mean, if you, if you listen to the stories of, uh, of, of reef tank aquarists, They will always tell you, oh, I got these corals, you know, on a live rock, you know, it was two millimeters, you know, and look at this, you know, now it's so big, you know, and it's so nice, you know. And the same thing, oh, I got this Acropora, you know, I bought it from a shop, you know, so cheap, you know, it was all brown, they didn't want it, you know, and now it becomes so colorful, you know. And this, so this is the most rewarding coral, you know. This is always the coral that they are the most proud of, you know. It's a coral that either come as a hitchhiker, you know, on the live rocks, or either, you know, the coral that was almost dead, and recovered and become beautiful, you know? So, so yeah. that's what I tell, you know, I mean, it's always rewarding to buy brown corals, you know, and get them to <laughs> alive again, and, colorful. And I can tell you that I have a special heart for an Acropora that I brought, that I bought, you know, almost brown. <laughs> and today is one of the most colored that I have in my reef tank. <laughs> you see, you see, all the, all the aquarists have a story like this. <laughs> because this is what they are the most proud of yes and it's, yeah, and it's yeah. fair enough yeah, and i understand you know i mean so that's why you know it's better to buy a brown one and 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 accept the challenge and try to fix it you yeah. know and and you know what i'm giving a lot of frags of this acropora now to my my friends here for example yeah. ricardo ricardo rio that is one of our colleagues here i gave him a frag of this acropora And, and this look is beautiful in his tank right now, okay? <laughs> Because it's already adapted to aquarium, you know? So now yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the best calls, you know, you can get, you know? It's called that yeah. already aquarium calls. Great. Yeah. Let's move ahead. Oh, Hoax am I. I love this Acropora. It's very beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's a very popular one, you know? Uh, Acropora Hoax am I, you know? I mean, it's, uh, it comes from Turbid, uh, Turbid Bay also, you know? So you can see one picture, you know, from where it's coming from, you know? So, so you can see the picture on top is uh, what it looks like in the natural environment, you know? So it's, it's, wow. it's, it's light, light blue, you know? And when we bring it in the south of Bali, you know, where there is big waves and upwelling and the water is colder, you know, this is where it becomes deep purple color mm -hmm. and it usually takes also the green polyps also you know so this is the thing you know but if we leave it in the south forever after six months it dies it's not made for this and yeah. you know so, so this is part of the reaction you know of the product to adapt so yeah, yeah so that's the way we do you know we grow them in the north when they are almost at the at the syllable size we bring them in the south put them three four weeks in the south and then after we sell them é, só para complementar o slide anterior, pessoal, eu tava brincando com ele que a acrópora mais bonita que eu tenho um coração especial no meu aquário hoje foi uma que eu comprei ela completamente marrom e ela tá maravilhosa hoje. E eu tô tirando é, 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 mudas dela aqui, dando para os meus amigos, né? E elas estão maravilhosas nos outros aquários também. Então, o que vocês estão vendo hoje aqui. É, são coisas que podem fazer a gente repensar, que a gente fica atrás da crópora maravilhosa e etc. E é, o grande desafio para o aquarista é pegar uma crópora dessa marrom e tornar ela mais bonita. Ou, nesse caso aqui, ela nem fica tão mais bonita, mas ela fica com um shape diferente. Né? E o que ele está dizendo aqui é mais uma crópora que eles tiram de um, de um lugar da Indonésia, colocam em outro e ela fica diferente. Muitos preferem ela assim também. What else more here, man? I found I found that species in Australia actually. Oh yeah? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have it in Australia, you know, they the just hooks. don't collect it, you know, because Australian yeah. collectors are blind. Yeah, yeah. Everybody uh, says about the Australian uh, hookies uh, here uh, that you can see uh, from airplanes that is totally blue and so on, no, correct? <laughs> can can I run the video here? There's a video, yes. yeah. Então, pessoal, é comum, né? Ele disse que encontrou várias dessas acrópolis também na Austrália, né? As Ruxemai aí são totalmente azuis. Isso aqui é na Indonésia, né? 
Yeah. This one is in Sumbawa. Sumbawa. So it, it never makes big colonies, you know, but that's the way you, you see it. You know, it's a beautiful one. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. the, the contrast of the Montipora, you know, with the branching across. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So this is uh, impact of change. Slide. So yeah, so so that's just just the explanation, you know, uh, about this uh, oxima, you know. I mean, uh, why why is is, is changing from uh, from uh, this uh, light blue color, you know, to this purple with green uh, tentacles, mm -hmm. you know? What's the difference between the two different uh, habitats, you know? So uh, the feeding strategy changes because in the south, the the the, the, the flu is much higher, you know. So it cannot feed as much as it can in the north, you know, because it's the, the food is is passing through a lot faster. So it's it's not equipped, you know, to actually catch the food in this kind of environment, you know. So it's quite of starving, you know, in this environment, you know. Then yeah. the water is cooler, you know, so it gets more oxygen, you know. So uh, there is less bacteria. There is uh, so it's difficult for him, you know, to feed properly. You know, I mean, uh, we I realize now, you know, that actually, you know, the, the the bacteria, you know, are more and more important, you know, into the into the the, the change of of corals. You know, it's uh, when you change them from one environment to another, you actually change the bacterial population, you know, that lives together with the corals, and it's probably one of the reasons why it's also changing color. So it's changing color because the water is, is less turbid, you know, so the water is, is, is cleaner. So there is more light, more UV, you know, so it has to produce more pigments. And it's then uh, the, 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 skeleton, the skeleton become more dense and the colony shape changes too. Yeah. Uh, pessoal, aqui ele está mostrando exatamente a, a Rixomoy aqui, é, simplesmente trocando de lugar para outro também, mais luz, mais UV, Uh, água clara, água, água mais limpa e etc. E ela vai adotar essa coloração aí. Uh, muito interessante. Vincent, I'm gonna take one minute here to say hello to everybody that we have here. We have a bunch Please, of people commenting. You can, if you take a look into the chat now, it's, uh, it, it's, it's blowing, you know. Just, just one right. minute. Here. Let's take some questions. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Pessoal, um alô aqui. Tiago Dias, deixa eu ver quem mais aqui, Ricardo Alves, Gilson, uh, Ricardo Júnior, Alan, Alan Velasquez, Kiusle uh, is here, you know, the boss is here, uh, Will Rocha, Hi, boss. <laughs> uh, Wagner Mendonça, Marcelo Modelão, Flávio Torres, pessoal, se eu pular o nome de alguém aqui, mil desculpas, mas tem muita mensagem, uh, Eduardo Carvalho, Uh, Daniel Pedroso, Daniel sempre aqui nas lives, Empório Aquático, Wagner Sanches. Oh, uma pergunta aqui do Wagner Sanches. É, não sei se seria possível, maybe, uh, talvez é, muito louco, perguntar é, suas experiências que ele teve criando algumas novas acrópolas. Talvez juntar uma com outra. Vamos perguntar aqui. Vincent, one, one question from the audience here. Have you ever faced any situation to mix one one species of acropora with another? Do you think this is possible? What, what do you mean? In the same... In aquarium, probably. In, in aquarium, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, okay, I like, I like things to be in order, you know, so I prefer to, uh, to have on, my, on the offshore farms, you know, I mean, on the ocean farms, you know, I prefer to have all my species, you know, one rack, one species, one rack, one species. But uh, when I do the restoration work, if I want the species to grow faster, actually I put them in competition with each other, you know? So, so in some particular case, you know, I like to mix on one rack different species mm -hmm. because they're gonna, they're gonna fight each other, you know? And they're gonna react differently. You yeah, know? I mean, sorry. they can change shape, they can change color and they will grow faster. Eventually, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there is always one winner. Yeah, but, but so I believe the question. Species, Ah, if you yeah. if you leave if you if you let your tank you know do grow by itself, I guarantee you you know that at some point at the end only one species will re will will remain. Okay. Because yeah. it will kill all the other ones. É, o, o, ele entendeu talvez errado o que eu perguntei aqui é que ele se você tiver duas acrópolas no aquário só duas espécies vai acontecendo de vai sobrar uma só. É interessante isso aqui também. 
But the question really, the question here, uh, uh, Vincent, is that uh, if you were, if is would be possible to have, for example, uh, an Atinwis, you know, together, not, not together, but, uh, uh, you know, have a sex, so, so, uh, so sexual reproduction with a milepora, for example. Okay, okay. So, so that's what they are doing in, in, in Australia. Wow. So uh, this is what AIMS, Australian Institute of Mind Science, they have a, a lab, you know, that they call the C-Simulator. C-Simulator. Yes, in Townsville, huh. in Australia. So what they do, I think they mixed, uh, so they do different things, you know. They, um, so they take, uh, they mix the spawn of different species of coral and they manage to get some hybrids of uh, tenuis and uh, loripes, if I'm not wow. wrong. They made some, some hybrids of tenuis and loripes. Wow. So, so and, and what they do, you know, they, they call this assisted evolution, which means that they're helping they accelerating the evolution, the natural evolution, they're accelerating it, you know? So what they do, they breed tenuis, they change the zoos until I, you know, I mean, they don't change, you know, but they inoculate, you know, the larva, you know, with a different species of zoos until that is more adapted to warmer temperature. So they're not very successful, you know, they have a lot of mortality, you know, at the moment, you know, into this, but yeah. there is some few ones which are surviving out of millions of larva, if there is 100,000 surviving, this is fair enough. But anyway, you know, so they managed to inoculate tenuis with a different species of zoosantele. And after they put those, those, those new strain of zoosantele tenuis on the reef. So wow. they assist the reef to actually change to a different species of zoosantele that is adapted to warmer water. Então, pessoal, respondendo se é possível, sim é, e ele conhece o pessoal lá da Austrália que está realizando esse trabalho nesse CC Lab, aonde o que eles fazem é, é já tem várias experiências, como por exemplo, como Latstella junto com Lorips, é, e o que eles fazem também é reimplantar as oxantela de uma acrópora para outra, mas ainda se tem muita mor é, é, morre muita acrópora ainda, mas é, isso já foi é, dominado, o que falta, obviamente, é mais estudos em cima, mas isso já é uma coisa que a comunidade científica marinha já, já sabe como fazer. Então, é, já já nós vamos ter espécies híbridas nos nossos aquários aí, tá? Very interesting. More here. Uh, Vinícius, so, yeah, so they are trying, you know, I mean, if you look at the evolution, you know, I mean, this is a theory of Veron, you know, I mean, if you, if you, uh, so yeah. I could show it, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. This is, yeah. if you look at okay. Coral of the World, and at the end of Coral of the World, they have one part, which is called, here yeah, it is, <laughs> species, okay. and uh, da, da, let me find it, you know, where they, da, da, da. evolution of species, you know, so this is the, the reticulate evolution, you know, so this is, I don't know if you can see. Here. Ele tá, ele tá explicando que ele é, e, e, ele tá mostrando a prova lá inclusive, pessoal, olha lá. Eles so, chamam de evolução da espécie lá, em cativeiro. So, né? so we call this the reticulate evolution, you know, and basically what it means is that a species of Acropora doesn't exist. They are all hybrids. So they all mix between each other, you know, and they, and that's why, you know, there is There is some species of uh, Acropora, like uh, I call it the, the Caroliniana, Suarsonoi, Loripes, Rosaria complex, you know. You never know, you know, I mean, you can only say, you know, that this one looks more like a Loripes, this one looks more like a Caroliniana, you know, but they're actually almost the same, you know. Caroliniana, Loripes, Granulosa, they mix each other, you know, it's, it's hard to see, you know, the border between the different species, you know, so already in the wild, you know, most of the species are actually breeds, you know. Uh -huh. Então, pessoal, ele está dando outros exemplos aqui também de loripes com, é, com granulosa e etc. Então, é algo dominado já. Vamos lá. Uh, Milepora, tell us about the millies here. Well, okay, so the millies, you know, I mean, they are they are very highly demanded, very popular calls. Uh, everybody is, uh, is asking for them, you know. 
the problem with millepora is it's a very meaty coral you know it's 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 a coral that have thick tissue you know and a long tentacle you know and actually for me you know it's a feeding machine it's uh, <laughs> you can see you know i mean the, the the coral you know i mean if you look at a millepora in the wild you will see that in the center of the tentacle in the center of the colony you know there is all those long tentacles you know and the coral is designed to actually you know stop the flow of water and make the particle fall down in the middle of the of the colony you know so it's a feeding machine and it's on top of the reef just bathing into the phytoplankton soup you know so it's really designed to feed a lot and uh, it's very colorful you know why it's very popular it's because it's very colorful it has a uh, tricolor, bicolor, you know, so many different color variation, you know, so that's why it's very popular, you know, but it's actually very hard to keep in aquarium because mm -hmm. you cannot feed them, you know, the, the, the way you need to feed them. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so you can keep them colorful, you know, usually the branch get thinner, the tentacle doesn't go out anymore. And if you look at the colony on, in the ocean, you know, it's very all the All the branch are the same, you know, they are all in aquarium. They, they tend to uh, grow in funny angles. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, you know, it's one coral that actually doesn't get better in aquarium. You know, it, it gets, mm -hmm. it doesn't get as good, you know, as in yeah. the ocean, you know, so it's, it's one challenging cause, but yeah. people keep on having, you know, it's also uh, my experience is like when I have Drupella. So, you know, Drupella, Drupella is a snail that feed on Acropora the parasite so in one farm you know i have all the species of acropora i have one rack with millepora you can be sure that if i have some drupella infestation you know the first place where they're going to land is on the millepora okay because okay. so much food for them you know so much yeah. tissue so much meat for them let me translate so that yeah well, it's not one prepared. coral that i recommend to uh, to, to beginners okay. let me translate that o que ele está dizendo é que simplesmente as miléporas é uma acrópora que ele não, não recomenda muito. Embora ela seja que tenha uma boa coloração já na, é, no habitat natural, ela é uma máquina de alimentação. Se vocês olharem a colônia dela, ela tem esse buraco ali que é exatamente para parar o fluxo da água ali e entrar alimentação para ela. É importante sab saber também que é, é, se chama... As acrópolas, principalmente as miléporas, elas têm os pólipos e os tentáculos. Se vocês olharem, tem os pólipos e o tentáculo que ele é um pouco mais comprido. Tem, é, nas colônias fica esses tentáculos grandes, bem estendidos para fora, né? Mas que é uma, é, ele é uma acrópora que ele acha que não fica melhor quando você coloca no aquário. Ela é mais bonita na natureza. Ok. Next one. Wow, a lot of milis. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's just yeah. That's why it's very popular in aquarium. You know, we get the rainbow on the top corner, and then the forest fire, then the red, the red with blue teeth, the purple one, the green ones, blue, um, red with green center. You know, and and the deep yeah. red. You know, and this is yeah. It's just so many different color variations. That's why it's very very popular. And and yeah. under blue light, it's. It's really exploding. É, e, e aí ele diz que, obviamente, no aquário com luz azul, ela vai, vai explodir de cores, né? Tá? So, you think that is a crop for LED light as well? Yes. I mean, this is where you get the most of it, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. it's good for LED. Yeah. But yeah okay. you, need, you, need, you need a lot of LEDs. <laughs> yeah, and this is what it looks like in the ocean, you know. So, so the slide before, you know, you can see this is a, this is colony that I grow in, a, in 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 the farm here. So this one, you know, most of them, you know, they are grown in a, in the south. So actually, even from a frags, from a very small size, they take a normal natural colony shape. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I like, you know. But if people that have them in aquarium, you know, they look weird. So I never find, if you look at on, on the next slide, you know, it's, yeah, that's the most of the colony shape, you know, we find in aquariums. Então, pessoal, and, aqui ele mostra and, exatamente uh, a, a diferença de morfologia, né, é, da, da, das miléporas, né, isso aqui é na, nas fazendas lá dele, exatamente dezenas de colorações, e aí depois quando você põe no aquário, 
ela pode se transformar desse jeito aí, é, segundo ele. Então, é uma acrópora difícil que ele acha que não fica melhor no aquário, né? Que está à prova disso aí. Uh, digifer digifer Very seldom I find some uh, digitifera is what I call the challenge, you know? I mean, this is uh, sometimes uh, sometime having... You know, sometimes I'm a little bit pissed off, you know, with the producer of lights, you know, because um, there are so many species of corals, you know, of especially Acropora, you know, that actually don't do well mm -hmm. under artificial lighting, you know, and, and Digitifera is one of them, you know, and, and, and actually, to be honest with you, you know, the only place where I've seen some nice Digitifera, you know, so, I mean, I've only been working for Triton, you know, for a little bit over a year, you know, now, you know, but I've mm -hmm. been a, a good friend of Essan, you know, for many, many years, you know, so I know his tank, I, I know his work, I know everything, you know, about it, you know, mm -hmm. so, but his tank was the only tank that I have seen in the world where someone could keep that species colorful and in a proper shape. That's the only tank where I have seen, you know, and Esano was always asking me, you know, was eager, you know, or oh, send me all the things that nobody else can keep, you know, and I would <laughs> send him, you know, those corals, you know, that no one else can keep properly with the proper coloration and all this, and he could keep them. And, and where was that? Ah, in Dusseldorf, you know, in his tank, in Dusseldorf. In, in Esan's tank. Ok, então pessoal, yeah, ele disse insane. que é, um, é uma acrópora que é um desafio. Se alguém quer o desafio, quem já é master em acrópora aí, né? Que tá aqui no nosso, o Júnior Melo tá aqui, quem mais? O, o Morales, Ricardo Rio, é o Carlinhos, estão tudo aí a turma, né? Se quer um desafio, tá aqui é só. Que até hoje ele só viu um aquário no mundo com o, a digitifera com o formato correto dela e a coloração. E foi o aquário do Essan lá em Düsseldorf. <laughs> so, kudos for Essan for that. So, yeah. so it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a funny cause, you know, because it's, it's so colorful, you know, that you can see it. It's really glowing on the reef, you know. You can see them, yeah. you know, like 20 meters away, you know, there is some red one, there is some green one, some purple mm -hmm. ones. They're really, really extremely colorful. And then mm -hmm. you take them, you bring them to the surface, they already lose color. Yeah. So by the time you just you just collect them and bring them uh, three four meters to the surface, you know they already the color already is losing it. You already losing color. So it's a, it's a, it's a very challenging coral, you know. So it's a one coral that I always tell people, you know. I mean, if you're really good, if your aquarium is really good, you know, try this. And not many people can keep it. <laughs> Ele está yeah, dizendo que o, 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 o aquário de você é bom. Coloca essa crop por aqui se for para frente é porque o aquário é bom. Um, que mais uh, eu tenho para dizer? Bom, let, let's go, go ahead. Humilis. Humilis. Humilis, it's another one, you know. So people can keep the green ones. Mm -hmm. The green one, many people can keep colorful, you know. But then we have some red ones, we have some tricolor ones, we have some purple ones, we have so, so many other colors, so many other colors of those acropora, you know. And nobody mm -hmm. can keep them. Outro coral também que exige, que é um outro desafio. I think, I think right now, you know, the, the, regarding Acropora, you know, mainly, you know, the way we develop the mainstream uh, technique of maintaining reef aquarium, you know, is just narrowing down the, the diversity of Acropora that we could actually maintain in a tank. And this is why I like Triton, and this is why I like the Triton method, is because this method, you know, is the only one, you know, that I actually broaden the diversity of Acropora that we can maintain in the tanks. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, Humilis is another one, you know, you, nobody can keep the colorful one, you know, properly. I have some red ones, they are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, o que o Vincent está dizendo aqui é que é outra crópora também, candidata, não é uma candidata, obviamente, a, a gente ter nosso aquário, mas se alguém quer um desafio, é, é só ter ela. E, e, e ele entende que o método Triton é um método que consegue tocar esse tipo de acrópora, ou, melhor dizendo, aumentar a diversidade de espécies com sucesso. Eu diria que é isso, tá? Palavras do Vincent tá aqui, um especialista, né? Okay, so, so this acropora, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. This acropora in the bottom left, what do you have the popular name of this acropora or is this humilis? It's just red humilis. Red humilis, okay, okay. 
wonderful wonderful uh, so what i want what i wanted to say is that uh, is like uh, i i spoke to uh, the owner of ecotech for example you know and i always ask them you know i mean why do you develop lights which only narrow you know the the the, the diversity you know of uh, a coral that we can keep you know i mean it's very mm -hmm. good for the, those blue led the, those blue led are very good for lps very 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 good for lps you know but because they they they, they realize that they want to develop you know i mean uh, they don't want to develop you know uh, aquarium that look like the ocean you know they want to develop you know i mean aquarium that have a very specific look you know and and maybe mm -hmm. they're right you know because at the same time yeah. we're developing you know some 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 corals some aquarium corals you know that only look mm -hmm. like that in aquariums because of that equipment but at the same time you know we are limiting you know our diversity of corals you know to some only one that adapt very well to blue leaves mm -hmm. Uh, on, on this, uh, just let me translate this. Ele está dizendo que ele conversou com vários fabricantes de luminárias, pessoal, e o projeto das luminárias geralmente é para ter acrópolas que se parassem diferente da natureza. Talvez se as luminárias fossem, fossem preparadas para ter é, o mesmo comportamento de onda, etc., do, é, do oceano, é, seria mais fácil de tocar esse tipo de, de, de espécie. Mas o projeto de luminárias que é feito e etc., é, beneficia outras espécies, tá? E que eles não, ele não acha que isso esteja errado, mas é, é, é o que é, né? E que o método Triton, obviamente, já facilitou isso aí. Uh, on this topic, I would like to ask you one question from a very important person, that is Junior Mello, here, that sent me a question. That's, have you ever measured the par of uh, your coral farms? Yeah, yeah. I I measured par, I measured UV, you know, and uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you go on, you know, at low tide, you know, on the coral farm, you know, on the you know, you can get two thousand, you know, par, you know, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Just uh, it's just huge, but I don't use that. I Vincent, I mean, your your. I mean, your... it's it's dangerous, you know, to use that high, you know. You know that's far, you know, it's a lot of light, you know, and, uh, and not all the gonna uh, I mean, you can say you know, that, uh, that uh, we thousand, you know, yeah. everything else is perfect. The koala, you know, so he has no other stress. Everything is in his uh, minerals, everything in his, everything is perfect. They can accept to one. Uh, thousand par you know and develop the pigments and everything you know if you try to give two thousand par in an aquarium you gonna burn of course uh, just a second vincent can you please turn off we are losing your you losing your audio okay uh can you okay. turn off your your camera and i will have only your voice now or move your computer you know because i i, I seem from your side here I, I don't know. Yeah, if okay. Let, let me let me check with my staff. You know, I'm gonna ask them to uh, go slow on the internet. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sure. Pessoal, enquanto isso eu vou dando um alô para vocês aqui. Ele vai dar uma olhada na na internet dele ali. Uh, muito legal. Fernando Morales, obrigado pela participação, Fernando. Jamie Ragowski, uh, quem mais está aqui? Marco Carvalho, Carvalho, Misael Salas, Bug Dreamer. Ô, oh, Marcelo, um abraço aqui, ó. Vou mandar um abraço para o Vincent. Marcelo, que estava aqui semana passada, conhece o Vincent, né? O uh, que mais? Gabriel Lafis está me ajudando sempre aqui. Ronaldo está aí, ó. Já fiz sua pergunta, Ronaldo. Você viu, ele já fez aqui, ó. Tá? O que mais? Uh... É, o pessoal gosta de tênis, né? Não tem jeito. Olha aí, ó. Tá vendo? Ó, o Ricardo está dizendo que Rosca Mai faz tempo que não vem. Então, aí que os já sabe é uma, uma crop para trazer, né? Beleza? O que mais? que mais? Estamos aqui, estamos aqui, estamos aqui, estamos aqui. Uh, hey, Alexandre is Araújo. working now? Yeah, it seems it's better. But uh, if, if we have the uh, uh, losing your voice, it's just turn, be... turn off the video, yeah. 
Yeah, you can turn off the video and we we'll stay with your voice, okay? Let's move ahead, my friend. Right. We have a bunch of slides here yet. Okay, so this is uh, uh, offshore reefs, yeah? Yes, all right. So that's from, uh, that's from another presentation, you know? So if I remember well, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so let me... Um, let me find it, you know, is it still the same presentation? Yes, it's still the same presentation, you know. So it's, uh, it's uh, we're trying to explain, you know, I mean, what the difference between uh, offshore is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, I mean, uh, I could, I don't know if I can show you pictures, you know. Can I mm -hmm. share my screen yes, with you? You can not? show, I can stop sharing my screen here. And you can, Wait, you can. I'm going to show you pictures. some picture from Australia, you know, so you can Great. understand, you know, what. Uh, ele vai, ele vai mostrar, uh, ele vai compartilhar a tela dele, pessoal, e mostrar é, fotos da Austrália agora, tá? De fotos pessoais dele. Aí. Could you find the share screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, just give me, let a me see. Just a second. Let me see. I have to grant to you. Uh, uh, to share just a second here uh, I will transfer to you you have to transfer back to me later uh, in find my name in chat and I give you uh, as a host now you can share you okay. are the host okay and how do I do that now share share screen wait wait let me put the the, the, the video again you know so I can see what I'm sharing yeah. Yep. Uh, share screen. Okay. Okay. Can Probably you see my screen coming. now? Not, not yet. Not yet. You have to ch choose share screen, and uh, okay, and select the. Right. Oh yeah, now it's coming. Good. It works. All right. So that's that's what it looks like, you know, on the on the offshore wow. reefs, you know. So this is where you find uh, you find uh, a lot of uh, most of the strawberry shortcake, you know. So I'm going to show you some, you know. That's very nice, Yacinthus, for example, you know, mm -hmm. Anthocercis, Clatrata, Yacinthus, uh, Microclados, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. That's Nick, you know, from Ultra Coral Australia. <laughs> that's Patulata, you know, some few Patulata, wow. you know, that we find over there. So, Humilis, all this, you know. So, you have to understand, you know, that those reefs, they are outside the Great Barrier Reef, you know. So, this is a reef which are in front of the Great Barrier Reef, you know. Yeah. J just one request, Vincent. Can you explain uh, uh, again about the PAR uh, measurement on your farm because the the audio we we lost your audio that time maybe it's a good time okay. as well to explain together here so have you right, ever so measured uh, the yes part yes i did part? and uh, and uh, and uh, so i have my par meter i have uv meter you know so i did use them you know on the farm you know but by uh, if you go at a good day you know at low tide you can go all the way up to almost 2000 Wow. 2000 wow 2000 <laughs> so this is huge the only thing what i was trying to explain is that is mm -hmm. that i would never recommend you know anybody you know to put 2000 par you know on their reef mm -hmm. you do because not recommend you to yeah no no i don't recommend because you have to understand that everything else is perfect for the corals it's yep. got perfect food yep. I would it's say that perfect water quality is got everything. So there is no stress for it. So it just received the stress. So this 2000 par is actually stressing it, but because everything else is fine. Yeah. Then is, is it can cope with it. That's but in an aquarium issue. where not everything is perfect, it's yeah. very risky. You're going to burn a lot of calls. If you try to that, do that. that, let me translate that. Pessoal, a pergunta do Junior Melo tinha sido se o, o, o Vincent já mediu o par nas fazendas de corais. E ele disse que sim, ele tem um medidor de par e ele anda com ele para lá e para cá. E quando a maré está baixa e o dia está claro, ele mede dois mil de pars nesses lugares. Mas que eh, ele não recomenda que você tenha dois mil de pars no teu aquário, porque lá no habitat natural, é, o resto todinho está perfeito, né? Então, é algo que você tem que ir testando muito, muito, com muita cautela, 
para o seu aquário se você quer elevar um par para ver o que vai dar na coloração. Então ele recomenda ter. So uh, Vincent, what, pa what par you really uh, uh, you usually recommend for a reef tank with the Indonesian Acropolis? Maximum, if you can say that. Well, I mean, I mean, if, if you go into uh, Millepora, Tenuis, and all this and Microclados, I would recommend you know, 600 to 1,000, you know, is good enough. 600 a 1,000 pars com Tenuis, uh, Millepora e os corais que a gente falou mais ou menos agora, ele diz que vai ser ótimo, né? So I'm using But less part than that. What you have to be very yeah. careful is that there is a huge... Carefully. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, 500, 400, you know, from 400 for a corpora is okay, you know. It's okay. But but you can go much higher. What you have to be careful is the UV. Ah, UV. Because the UV is not measured in the park, and uh, and the UV you cannot see with your eyes. But yeah. some LEDs actually can can produce a lot of UV, mm -hmm. and uh, and this. The UV, that's why I don't like too much the PAR, you know, that's why I don't think the PAR is too relevant, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the UV, you know, is the key, you know, and if you use, you can use quite a lot of UV, you know, uh, I forgot what, what the measure is, but... Uh, yeah. ele, ele falou, pessoal, que o UV é muito importante, que, é, que essas luminárias novas chegam a um V absurdo. Ele mede o V lá também, ele mede PAR e UV, tá? E... Eu falei para ele, inclusive, que... So, Vincent, I'm, I'm running about 400 pars in the top uh, of my aquarium. I'm using T5. So, maybe I can try a little higher, no? Maybe. Yeah? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think so, so, I'm sorry. Sorry to But interrupt. as I say, you know, you need, you need to be careful with the UV, you know? You need Absolutely. to be careful with the UV, you know. So, so, so if you the the Acropora can take a lot of UV, you know. But then, if you have some uh, LPS, you know, below on this and that, you're gonna burn your LPS, you know, with UV. Ah, perfeito. Ele falou que o UV aqui a Acropora vai adorar e etc. Mas se tiver algum LPS, vai derreter ele. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, let's move ahead with your pictures. Great. Yeah, so that's that's what a uh, offshore reef look like, you know. So the water mm -hmm. is perfectly clear, and uh, and a lot of waves, a lot of current, and uh, this is where the the, the corals are really uh, amazing. And for me, you know, I mean, this is uh, this is the most difficult environment to to reproduce, you know. So you have all the entocercis, you know, all the microclados. The strawberry shortcake, you know, come from this area, you know, the very nice Yacinthus, you know, come from that area. A few, some few grasses, you know. But yeah, it's uh, it's difficult, you know. Here we are, the, mm -hmm. the strawberry shortcake. Well, that's an antocercis again. That's mm -hmm. a strawberry shortcake. So you can see, you know, the strawberry shortcake, you know, in the middle of the of that picture, you know. This yeah. coral is really glowing, you know, and I've never seen, you know, strawberry shortcake like this in a crime. <laughs> as good as that. So for me, it's still difficult, you know. And <laughs> if you want to recreate this environment, you really need to, to only keep a corpora because you can see, you know, on, on this reef, you know, there is few soft corals, you know, here and there, you know, but it's mainly, mainly a corpora, you know. Mm -hmm. You have very few LPS, very few other corals than mm -hmm. a corpora. Então, pessoal, vocês podem ver que nesse lugar aqui que tem essas acrópora maravilhosa, toda colorida na Austrália, que são fotos dele, você não está vendo nenhum LPS, você não está vendo soft lá. Então, muitas vezes, não adianta a gente querer colocar tudo isso num lugar só, porque não vai dar certo. Vai ser melhor escolher um par aí de 400, no máximo, uns LPS da mesma região, que você vai ter sucesso. Você vai ter um aquário misto né? uh, uh, e um aquário maravilhoso. That's great picture. Yeah. Well. Like that picture, you know, like, for example, this is at 20 meters deep, you know, because you can see the plate are pretty big, you know, you can see it's mm -hmm. getting a, a little bit more deeper, you know, 20 meters deep, you know, we had a visibility of 50 meters, you know, so the water was really crystal clear. Yeah. Compared to Indonesia, you know, so the corals here don't, don't get much food, you know, they are very, very little food, you know, so that's very ultra low nutrient system, you know, if you give Stop them a little bit of... So and, and, a little bit of phosphate or nitrates, you know, then they won't like it. They won't like it. 
and why it's so the, that the typical that's the conception of the of the of the reef you know that people have in mind you know that the reef in the middle of the desert you know where there is no food you mm-hmm. know actually on those roof on those reefs there is no food for the corals there is so many mouths to feed that there is no food left for anybody so that's why they really need light you know but the inshore reef you know where most of the other corals are coming from you know the corals get a lot of food então, let me translate that. Uh, esse lugar aqui na Austrália é 25 metros, você pode ver que a, que a água está cri, cristalina aí, né? E é por isso que os corais têm mais cores aí nesse caso, mas também não tem alimentação, não tem nada. Ou seja, colocar esse, esses corais aí no, no seu aquário vai exigir muito mais cuidado. So, Vincent, you have to select my name in the chat and send back to me uh, as a... Um, Host, probably. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So I have to understand yeah. already what share. So I sent to you as a chat. Did he worked or not? Where I, I sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, uh, expand the participants. Yes. And I did select my name more. Uh, and there, there is an option to make it host. Wouldn't find it. Select uh, my name. No, I haven't find it. You know, so I'll try to find, and I'm gonna reply some uh, uh, question here. Let me see here. You are the host. There's a host name beside your name into a participants uh, window. Okay. Select my name and, and you have a, 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 an icon more. And you see participant make Participant window is on the uh, participant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. You okay. find it? No? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We do it. More host. okay, host. host, yeah, now, yeah, okay, great. All right, <laughs> made it. <laughs> don't worry, you don't mess it up. The presentation, <laughs> all right, cool. All right, okay, so you showed a lot of pictures of offshore. Ele mostrou várias yes. fotos pessoal de Recife de Alto Mar. Olha que interessante, por isso que os corais de lá são mais caros, and this is. This is the reason that offshore corals are more expensive because it's much more difficult to collect, correct? Well, I mean, it's a mission, you know, to go there. It's a mission, literally a mission. You know, I mean, I trust uh-huh. me. You know, I mean, this is uh, so. So, depending on the collectors, you know, in Australia, you have either the people, you know, that go for seven days, you know, like uh, I, I want give names you know but you have people that have big boats you know and they go for seven days you know and then the last day of the trip they're going to collect acropora you know and then they're going to come back you know and you have some people you know like nick that just go you know and come back you know the same day you know so it takes three four hours you know wow three four hours to go you know then you spend four or five hours underwater collecting the collecting the the, the corals and filling the boat and another four hours of Pessoal, you have to transfer é um... this into a truck, you know, and bring back this to the facility, you know, it's it's a mission, you know. The uh-huh. people trust me, you know, I mean they, they do a crazy those people are crazy. They're just crazy, you know. What the, the work they, they are doing is crazy. 170 km offshore on a boat, it's a long way, you know. Pessoal, 170 km na Austrália para chegar no lugar onde tem esses corais como a shortcake. E é uma missão para ele, ele diz, é uma missão de sete dias. É por isso que tem corais que são mais caros que outros. Né? O cara mergulha horas durante o dia. Geralmente, eles ficam sete dias lá coletando peixes, outras coisas, e as acrópolas eles coletam no último dia, por razões óbvias, obviamente. E aí é 170 quilômetros navegando, pessoal, para chegar nesses lugares aqui. A barreira de corais da Austrália é gigantesca. Tá? Então, algumas curiosidades aí para vocês. São so, new tools to keep uh, challenge species. 
Tell more about okay. this. It's what we talked before about methods, you know, uh, tools to control the aquarium. All of that we can take advantage to keep different species, correct? Exactly, you know, to, uh, to, to keep those species, you know. So, so I mean, I, li I, like, I like the fact, you know, that actually, you know, like Ecotech, which is a leader in light. Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't use Ecotech, you know, but I always mention, but they have two models of light, you know. Now they have a, like a more natural light and they have a blue model, you know. So they have, they start to understand, you know, that the, the only blue, you know, is not the solution, you know. They need to have a diversity, you know, in, their, in oh. their light. They cannot have one light that's gonna work for all the calls. So that's why I think they came up, you know, with two models, you know, of the mm -hmm. region five. And so, uh, which is good, you know. What, what lightning you use in your, in your uh, farm? So me, I use the the magic. The... Huh? I use Illumagic. Illumagic. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. You use that. Okay. It's a different type of uh, yes. LED. And okay, good. It's, uh, uh, I mean, for me, for Acropora, I think is the best LED I tried. You know, I tried, the, the problem is, I mean, Bali is a tropical island, you know, so you probably have uh, the same problem in some part of Brazil, you know, but humidity is 100%, you know. The normal lights, you know, they don't last long enough for me, you know, so I need to have them tropicalized so they last longer, you know, because we have too much humidity here. Uh, pessoal, ele falou o nome da luminária que ele, que ele usa lá, é Illumilight, uma coisa assim. Eu já vi uma matéria sobre isso, inclusive, depois eu vou disponibilizar do canal. E o que ele está dizendo aqui é o seguinte, que as novas ferramentas que a gente tem, método, triton, e, e, e as luminárias, por exemplo, ele falou da Ecotec, que tem uma luminária agora que, que ele tem, tem um modelo que é azul e branco, e tem outra que é uma iluminação mais natural, pensando exatamente nisso aí, em uh, desenvolver espécies mais complicadas nos nossos aquários, né? Aumento de competição, aumento de melhoria nos sistemas de circulação, tudo isso aí está facilitando para se ter uh, espécies mais difíceis. Ok. Not all corals are equal in the Great Barrier, correct? Yeah, so that's why the thing, you know, so you can see, you know, on top, you know, you can see some uh, inshore reefs, you know, with, uh, with more branching corals. And on the bottom, you know, you can see some, coral, some reef, you know, which are from the outer reefs, you know, so with clear water. So the nutrient level, you know, is different, you know, the quantity of food they get is different, you know, and the quality of water, you know, is, is I think, different because the outer reef, you know, there's a lot of more waves, so there's a lot of more oxygen, so the pH should be higher. So the water is clearer, you know, and the water quality in general is better, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, while you are inside, you know, you get big rivers, you know, which are bringing a lot of nutrients. So the water quality is not, I mean, you still don't have nitrates and phosphate, you know, or very little, you know, but, but you have a lot of food, you know, available for them. You know? That's, mm -hmm. that's the, 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 main, the main thing. Então, pessoal, a grande uh, barreira de corais na Austrália é altamente diversificado é, locais que, que têm altos nutrientes e água turva, baixos nutrientes, água cristalina, zona de alto fluxo, alto é, é, oxigenação, pH mais alto, redox também. Tudo isso aí tem uma, uma variedade de ambientes. Ele vai mostrar pelo menos quatro ou cinco aqui. Ok? Uh, this is semi temperate uh, reefs, correct? So, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's the way it works on, uh, in Australia, you know, I mean. Um... Mm -hmm. There is a, this is a place, for example, you know, I mean, everybody thinks, you know, that all the corals come from everywhere in Australia, you know, but actually, you know, it's, no. it's many different, very, very different habitats. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in the south of the Great Barrier Reef, you know, this is where you get, it's what they call Akans land, you know, this is where you mm -hmm. have all the Akantastria, you know, Akans. the micro ah. ones. So this is almost temperate reefs, you know, I mean, uh, pretty much, you know, of what you get in, uh, in Brazil, you know, in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Rio, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, 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 it's not tropical, you know, but almost tropical, you know, so it's semi-temperate, mm -hmm. you know, reefs. Uh, so the water gets cooler. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have, uh, you have a lot of algae, algae growing, you know, I mean, macro algae, you know, growing on the reef, mm -hmm. a lot of sea fan, a lot of sponges, a lot of soft corals. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have, you know, I mean, Acropora reef, you know, like you can see on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, but then you will, this is where they find, uh, so the Micromusa, they find a lot of Goniopora, Alveopora, you know, mm -hmm. over there, you know, 
So they go and collect over there a lot. So there is big swells over there, you know, from the Southern Ocean because there uh -huh. is no barrier protecting the reef, you know, so you have big swells coming in mm -hmm. and, uh, and the water is, is a little bit dirty, you know, and it goes down to 16, 18 degrees, you know, during winter. Yeah. Tem, let me translate that. Okay. Pessoal, aqui é o, 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 o que ele chama de região semitemperada, com clima, não é tropical, não é igual do Brasil, mas muito parecida, mas é uma área de oceano aberto, você pode ver que a barreira de corais começa um pouquinho para cima ali, né? é um lugar mais frio, está falando de 24, 25 graus, alta corrente, mais escuro, e é o lugar das acãs, das micromussas uh, e corais uh, LPS, praticamente, muito pouco SPS, quase nenhum, e tem as suas, uh, 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 obviamente, características para esses corais. Tem muita alga lá, esponjas e etc. Então, você começa a já captar, se você quer fazer um reef com esse tipo de coral aqui, é, é, ir para o caminho de, de montar, reproduzir esse ambiente aqui. Hein? Olha só que informação. Next slide. Yeah. So that's play. the kind of coral that you can find uh, in those mm. places, you know, wow. in, uh, a few scolinias, a lot of, of the acans, and some nice goniopora, some few echinophilia, and uh, acropora glauca, you know, the solar flare acropora from the southern great Barrier. A lot of soft coral there too. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very, it's very different from what we Imagine, you know, you can see a lot Man. of algae, you know, you can see. Yeah, I can see that. Semi uh, Vincent, one question here. Uh, how how Please. how are the nutrients here in this place? A little higher or, or low nutrients? I would say a little higher, you know, because there is many rivers. Mm -hmm. So it's really close to the shore. It's really on the shore, you yeah. know, so you have the influence of the rivers, you know, and, uh, and you know, I mean, uh, The rivers brings in a lot of nutrients, you know. So there you have phytoplankton blooms, you have zooplankton yes. blooms, and uh, and the temperate water is finally, you know, more productive, you know, than uh, tropical waters, you know. So mm -hmm. so there is more food there, you know, than actually in the, in the places which are northern. Yes, excellent. Next slide. Okay, here we say low temperature, medium circulation, illumination, medium, high nutrients. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, let's move ahead. That, that's, uh, that's already understood. Uh, okay, Recife Costal. This is inshore reef, correct? So, so this is what they call the, the LPS land. This LPS. is where you find most of the LPS, uh -huh. which is um, the torches, the gold torches, because in Australia right. they almost don't have any green torches. This mm -hmm. is where you're going to find the Australomusa. The Scolimia and the Australomusa and the, the, the Lord, and the, sorry, the, uh, the Bower Benki. Bower Benki. Uh, this, is, this is where you're going to find the Trachyphilias. This is where you're going to find the Catalaphilias. This is where you're going to find the Blastomusa. This is most, where you're going to find the Mast. Most, yeah, most of the areas, you know. <laughs> This is okay. where you're going to find the Fabites, you know, the, 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 the world of war, the world of paint war. You, where you, yeah, many, most of the Australian LPS, you know, come from this area, you know, so the, the inshore reefs, you know, so, so that the reef which are in between the shore and the Great Barrier Reef. So you have ah. plenty of small islands, which are also semi-tropical reef island because you don't have any coconut trees or anything, you know, only from Cairns you start to have coconut trees, you know. <laughs> Me, that's the way I see it, you know I mean? And so you say, well, why the island don't have any coconut trees? So yes, yeah, so there is no coconut trees. And this is where you're going to find, you know, yeah, yeah, most of the LPS. Yeah. Very oh. murky, very weird current, high tides, you know, because like in the place where they collect the, The trachyphilia, you know, you have seven meter, you know, tide and pitch, wow. you know, so, so huge current, huge mm -hmm. tides, big mangroves on the shore, you know, a lot of crocodiles, you know, you, I don't like to go diving, you know, too close to the shore, you know, because of the crocs, a lot of tigers, a lot of tiger sharks, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fish, big fish, very murky water, a very, very particular environment, and this então, is where, yeah. Yeah, it's a local... 
é, dos recifes costais ou do reef inshore, ou seja, tem a praia e na frente estão as ilhazinhas ali de recifes, é o que ele está explicando aqui. Esse é o lugar dos LPS, escolimias, traquefilias, eufilias, tudo vem daqui, tudo vem da Austrália, vem desse lugar que vocês estão vendo de vermelho aqui, né? Água doce, hum. altos nutrientes, alta maré, chega a 7 metros a maré nesse lugar, e tem bastante corrente, não tem ondas, mas tem corrente, corrente muita, alga sargaço, né? E, e, é, água... Agora sargaço Yeah. E, e, e um lugar completamente snob, é, em nosso o porque... sargassum é quando o uh, when, when water se torna warm, you know, o sargassum bloom, you know, and they are covering uh -huh. everywhere, and then during the when the when the water temperature goes down, you know, they disappear. Yeah. E nesse lugar tem crocodilo, tem tubarão tigre, ou seja, é um lugar que ele não gosta de mergulhar, não. Ele falou, ok, let's move ahead. So these are the LPS you find there, correct? Yeah, wow. so most of the euphilias, blastomosa, trachyphilia, yeah, the classic Australian LPS. Então, você já sabe, pessoal, se você quer ter uh, essas eufilias e esses corais que vocês estão vendo aqui, você vai ter que ter nutriente mais alto. Não tem jeito. So, if people would like to have this type of coral, they will need to have more, uh, higher nutrients in this place. Which means feeding, you know, doesn't mean more phosphate and nitrates, you know, it means more feeding. <risos> more feeding, ou seja, não necessariamente mais nutrientes tão altos, mas muito mais alimentação. So you believe, if I have a very low nutrient, like, a, let me give an example of a nitrate of 0.5, I don't know if it's high for you or not, and a phosphate of 0.02, that is what uh, Triton recommends, okay? And some of these corals maybe not like this environment. If I feed them a lot, like twice a week, maybe It I can get... Fine. It's fine? It's actually the best environment, you know, is to have the, the lowest nitrates, you know, and the lowest uh, phosphate, you know, and then just feed them, you know, because it doesn't... Them. This water is not rich in phosphate and nitrates, you know, it's just rich in food. Rich in food. The food is consumed, so, you know, by, I mean, the nitrates and phosphate, you know, is consumed by the phytoplankton, you know, which is consumed by the zooplankton, you know, before wow. it even gets to the corals. Pessoal, olha só que informação so, valiosíssima aqui. O que ele está dizendo é que nesse lugar, na realidade, o nutriente se medir ali é baixo. Porém, esse lugar é altíssimo em nu nutrimento. So, I can say that the nutrient and nutriment is different, correct? Different. It's what you were saying. Exactly. Yeah. Or well, say, nutrients is the food, you know. It's it's the same and different at the same time. You know, nutrients, you know, is phosphate and nitrates and ammonia and all this. You know, that's the mm -hmm. result. You know, and nutrients, you know, is the food itself. You know, so mm -hmm. this this part is is rich in nutrients, not in nutrients. Wow. Então, pessoal, você consegue ter sim, mas o que você vai ter que fazer é alimentar bem. E obviamente que no aquário, se você alimentar com uma frequência alta, você vai subir o teu nível de nutrientes. Aí as acrópolas já podem perder coloração. Então, é, você vai ter que achar um balanço para isso aí. Ok. The gold tart, the gold hammer, não? Yeah, gold hammer, you know, so same thing, you know, it's in this kind of environment, you know, so needs uh -huh. uh, to be fed, you know, regularly. Yeah. I mean, especially yeah. the, the one from Australia, they are very sticky, you know, I mean, you can see, you know, I mean, they, I'm used to, to handling, you know, euphilia, you know, and here I'm, I'm pretty good, you know, I don't get stung, you know, by, uh, by euphilia, you know, but those hammers in Australia, they hurt me. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about um, uh, okay, inshore so, so that, yes, so that's the, also the, sorry, sorry. Uh, I need to get to the right slide. So that the inshore islands, you know, so just offshore, you know, the the coast, you have some few islands, you know, and uh, with reefs around, you know, so it's still it's still another environment, you know, where uh, you have uh, the water is a little bit clearer, but still very murky, still high nutrients, you know, and 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 also a lot of uh, tides going there, mm -hmm. you know, and this is where you're going to find, you know, where all the gold torch and all the, all the scolies and uh, where you're going to have a lot of scolies. 
So this is around Mackey area, you know, it's like everybody thinks, you know, the scolies they're coming from only one small area, you know, which is between uh, the Wad Sunday Islands, you know, which is just uh, Bowen and Porcupine, mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, Gipun. So just around Mackay is just the area on those islands, you know, in red where you find the scolies. Mm -hmm. Up north and down south, they are very, very rare. This is where you're going to find all the boa banki too. So uh -huh. you find some reefs, you know, with uh, a lot of acropora, you know, it's going to be a lot of milleporas, a lot of tenuis, a lot of montipora. Uh, this is where you're going to find what they call the cherry, or they call it this acropora rosaria. Rosaria. Yeah, the one that, which is on top, you know, it's uh, beautiful. it's, it's beautiful. very beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cherry, cherry, cherry something. I forgot, you know, the, the common uh -huh, name. You know, but right. This is where you find all those species, you know, but then you're going to find very few spatulata. You're not mm -hmm. going to find any strawberry shortcake there. You're not going to find any anthocerces there. You're going to find some yacinthus, you know, but different coloration. And, and it's probably actually a different species than the one which is on the offshore reefs, you know, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard that in the new classification of Acropora, you know, Acropora yacinthus got separated in four different species, you know. So, so I wouldn't be surprised that uh, the, the Acropora yacinthus that you find inshore and the Acropora yacinthus that you find offshore is different species. Okay. So, yeah, so it's a medium to high uh, circulation. Uh, it's it's easy coral habitat, you know. I mean, this is where you find most of the species. You can mix uh, LPS and SPS, and you don't need too much light. Uh, you don't need too much nutrients. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's a good habitat. It's the easiest one mm -hmm. to recreate. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yep. So yeah, so. So this one is, uh, is uh, the inside of the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. So the water starts to get clean over there, you know, because all the coral that were on the coast and inshore, you know, already fed on all the, all, all the nutrients. So there is not much food left anymore, you know, into the, into the water, you know. It's still a little bit murky, you know, but not too much, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. There is quite a bit of current. And because the tides are, are still big, eh? when you are at high tide, you don't see nothing, you know. And then when you are at low tide, you know, you have islands everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the place, you know. So on the next slide, you know, you can see the species you're going to find over there, you know, wow. so in this particular one. You know, this is where you're going to find, you know, all the spatulata, you know, in the very shallow reef. So on the on, on the shallow area where the current is very strong actually you know because in between tides you literally have rivers you know that are yes. flowing through this this area you know so when the the, the the tide goes down all the water which is inside the, the the lagoon you know is flowing outside you know so you have a river you know getting through this you know you have a lot of soft corals uh you still have a bit of lps you know like uh, some few euphilia encora some few catalaphilias Mm -hmm. And a lot of Montipora, a lot of Acropora, you know. So you really have the nice diversity of SPS and LPS, you know, in, in this area. You know, this is my favorite part of the reef, you know, because you find everything there. You find some LPS, you find some soft coral, you find some hard corals. And uh, this is also, yeah, this is uh, the, the nicest area of the reef for me. Então, pessoal, aqui é o lugar que o Vincent mais gosta de toda a barreira de corais, porque você acha uma infinidade, você, uma grande diversidade de SPS, de LPS, softs, no mesmo lugar. Aqui tem uma corrente gigantesca, a maré que ainda existe, a ondulação com, é, consegue chegar, né? É, a, lá no inshore ela está protegida pela barreira, obviamente, tá? Então, aqui, a, 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 na realidade, a disponibilidade de comida não é tão grande, mas que é um mix muito interessante dos corais que se encontra aqui é, e que se poderia ter no aquário, né? Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, this is a, this is also you know an, an habitat which is perfect for corals uh, uh, because you don't need too much flow, you don't need too much light, and you uh -huh. still have a, a little bit of uh, nutrients, regular feedings. 
and most coral will adapt to that, you know. So that's why it's 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 my favorite place on the reef. Yeah. What what species is this? Is the Sarmentosa or not or not? Uh, let me think about it. You know, I mean, I yeah. I, I, <laughs> I think I identified it as a granulosa. You know, granulosa. Okay, granulosa. But yeah. it's uh, it's one unique granulosa. You know, we found it in. Uh, wow. In the lagoon, you know, on the on the reef over there, you know, it's, uh -huh, it's uh -huh. amazing. I think Jake has some. Uh, Jake has some in his tank. Uh -huh. There's some a little bit in Japan. Yoshi also has a little bit on in his tank. It's um, amazing. Coral, amazing yeah. aquapora. It's funny, you know, because there is plenty of things that we find on the on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, that actually the collectors because. Because the market, you know, the market, they tell them, oh, we want strawberry shortcake, we want strawberry shortcake, you know. So, <laughs> so the collector go there and they just collect strawberry shortcake, you know, while there is so many other nice calls. Yeah. Então, pessoal, o que, ele tá, o que ele está dizendo aqui é que esse é um coral maravilhoso. Eu perguntei, ele disse que é uma provavelmente uma granulosa, né? Ele não se lembra o nome da espécie, mas, mas disse que o Jake Adams tem no aquário dele. E geralmente o pessoal nem se interessa por esses corais. São corais mais fáceis de estocar no mercado, no, no, no aquário. Né? na realidade, esses corais que estão nessa região aí, para eles são os melhores corais, que todo mundo chega e pede que era a, a, a crop para shortcake, 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 e não dá valor para esses corais aqui. Então, o que a gente tem que sa saber é conhecer esses corais, pedir para os importadores e etc., e a gente começar a estudar, porque aí começa a mudar essa coisa também. Né? Como vocês podem ver aqui, é, não precisa de muita eliminação, não precisa de muita circulação, nutriente médio, esse coral iria muito bem em qualquer um dos nossos aquários aqui, então se adaptam fácil também. Oh, here we have more. Beautiful yeah. language. Yeah. So this is the way uh, we collect uh, corals in Australia. You can see it's, it's, it's surgery, you know. <laughs> a small Very piece nice. here, a small piece there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nick from Ultra Coral Australia is a great collector. Ultra Corals, okay, very nice. Yeah. So this is uh, lagoons. So yeah, so so once so you you pass this first inshore barrier reef and then you get inside the lagoons. So mm -hmm. there the water is murky, you know. The water is murky. The lagoons are prof, uh, deep, you know. So you can find a. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of deep water corals, you know. Such this is where they collect the acanthophilia. This is where they collect uh, some catalaphilia. This is where they collect a lot of deep water. A lot of uh, the gold, the gold echinophilia also come from there. Uh, there is high tide amplitude, you know. So so at low tide, you know, then the, the water become completely still inside, you know, with no current. And then when the tide goes through, you know, so you have to understand, you know, that actually the, the tide goes, goes through the higher reef, you know, every time of the day, you know, so, so when the low tide, you know, is going in, you know, so the, the water really get through the reef in and out, in and out twice a day, you know, so, mm -hmm. so the reef goes in outside water, inside water, inside water, outside water, you know, so at low tide, the water is perfectly still. And then there is, three hours of rush, wow. the water coming in until it reach high tide, then it becomes still, almost still. And then after it start to go down, there is three hours of rush, then it slows down, and then there is one hour of still. And this every day. So yeah. the current is pretty strong, you know, but they have some time, you know, where the water is, is completely still, you know. And uh, this is where the lagoons, you know, this is where the, the food's going to settle, you know. This is where all mm -hmm. the food, because it becomes, all of a sudden, there is no more flow. So all mm -hmm. the food's going to go down. So this wow. is why you, where you find all those, um, so Echinophilia or Fernsis, you know, that is really a cryptic species that lives in the hole between all the corals where all this food's gonna settle, you know? So it's a very particular environment, you know? We find all those red gonioporas, the one with big tentacle. We found this pink neftia, you know, that are absolutely gorgeous. Some cinarina at the bottom, yeah, some, yeah. some very nice acropora field, large branching acropora, orida, esquisita, formosa, oxemai. Mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very nice environment. Então, pessoal, agora as lagoas recifais, né? Isso aqui é... É, tem que saber um pouquinho, obviamente, como é que funcionam as marés, 
seis horas, né? Sobe a maré, aí muita circulação para dentro dos atóis ou para essas lagoas, uma grande diversidade de LPS, alguns SPS, mas SPS maravilhosos, segundo eles, entra a comida, comida desce, etc. Depois a maré vai, tem o, re, o reponto da maré que se chama, né? Depois vai descendo a maré, liberando, entra água nova, não tem tanta circulação. E aí você, Goniópora é o lugar, Sinarina também, ou todos esses tipos de corais aí tem nesses locais aí. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, 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 yeah, that's also an environment which is good for, for aquarium corals. You know, this is not too difficult, you know, to recreate. Não é tão difícil. Uh, this is where most of the, of the coral, you know, will will settle, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's not too tough, you know, for course, it's mm -hmm, nothing particular, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Okay, one more video here. Yes, <laughs> that's inside the lagoon, you know. So, inside the lagoon, wow. <laughs> yes. How deep is, is this place? Oh, this is very shallow, you know, this is probably two, three meters deep. Três metros, pessoal, esse lugar aí na yeah, lagoa. Yeah. Recife de Lagoa. It's me, né? it's me collecting, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's too shallow, you know. It's too difficult uh -huh. to work. Wow. Let's go to see, you know, in surgery. J just few tips, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so after you have the outer barrier, if you know. So this is mm -hmm. the place which is already more exposed. More that, exposed. Uh, that, that dominated by acropora by plating acropora you know so so the water is is clear not so much food very low nutrients very mm -hmm. very high light very high current and yeah this is this is the acropora acropora environment you know this is we entering the, the place which is a little bit difficult you know to uh, to recreate mm -hmm. you know so in, in the shallows you will find species such as robusta you know which or you milis, you know, that can take a little bit waves and uh, a little bit deeper, you will find strawberry shortcake, Yacinthus anthocelsis, and mm -hmm. uh, some weird species like this elkhorn, you know, um, Atropoa sucarnoi. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the typical, you know, SPS, Atropora environment. Pessoal, já começa a sair para fora da barreira de corais aí, né, ou, ou no limite dela, já começa um ambiente só de SPS, baixíssimos nutrientes, alta luz, né? altas ondas, ondulações, corrente, e aí o negócio começa a ficar pesado. So, uh, Vincent, uh, it's not an easy place to dive. Uh, I, no, I you, need a, you, you need a good, you need good weather, first of all, you know, so, <laughs> so you, you have to use the, the window, you know, the weather window, you know, so you have to wait, window. you know, until you have a good weather window, you know, and then you go out there. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's that's the way it works, you know. I mean, you cannot go there every day, you know. You can only go there, you know, maybe four or five days a month. Yeah. Então, pessoal, eles esperam sempre a janela. Time, you know, the weather is not yeah. A janela do tempo não dá para ir lá todo todo o tempo que se quer, não, porque não adianta. É assim que funciona, né? Yeah. Oops. Okay. What this means? Different to reproduce so, the environment. Yeah, it's 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 it start to be challenging, you know, to uh, to uh, to reproduce. You know, it's a it's, it's a difficult coral habitat. You know, it, 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 you need very high flow, you need high light, you need very low, very low nutrients. You know, and you need a bit of feeding. You know, because there is a, there is still a bit of food. You know that gets through. You know, mm -hmm. I think right after it, you know, there is a video of it. You know, so 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 this will uh, will talk more. You know, to, to Mm -hmm. Yep. Can Excellent. Show the video. Wow. So now we comes to the extreme place, I believe. <laughs> so that's the extreme place, you know. That's the otter reef, you know. So this is uh -huh. a small patch reef, you know, that actually don't come out of the water, you know, at low tide. So they are always in the water, mm -hmm. and they are like a few kilometers, you know. I mean, like one, two, three, four, five, ten kilometers, you know, off. The Great oh. Barrier Reef. So uh -huh. it's small reef, small patch reef, you know. And there is on those patch reefs, there is one place that really collect all the corals and all the food, you know. And at this place, you have only table acropora, you know. 
All wow. the world, you know, from top to bottom is only table acropora. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, where, uh, where the land is expensive, you know. Everything is colonized by coral, it's 100% coral cover. And, uh, and this is probably the most challenging environment to recreate in aquarium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the conditions are just perfect, you know, <laughs> big wave, no. in big flow, big oxygen, high pH, <laughs> and, and clear water. So yeah, it's it's probably you know the most challenging environment. Pessoal, eles chamam esse lugar aqui de Hardline. Hardline is the name, correct? Yeah. Yes. É, e aqui é o inóspito. É, o coral aqui não fica exposto em nada. Ele está muito sempre em uma profundidade boa. É uma parte pequena, 5, 6 quilômetros do do, do do coral os, é, offshore que ele que estava mostrando anteriormente ondulações fortes, nutrientes muito baixos, água cristalina e bastante complicado de chegar lá e coletar coral. E, obviamente, que aqui é o ambiente mais difícil de se reproduzir nos aquários. Tá? Eu vou brincar agora com ele, que o Kiusley teve essa semana passada aqui em casa e viu meu aquário e disse assim, você está louco, você tem muita circulação no teu aquário. Né? É, olha só como é que está. Eu, eu, eu gosto de circulação porque isso ajuda a tirar todos os nutrientes, né? So, Vincent, I was joking because Kiusley was here at home this last week and he saw my reef tank with a lot of flow. I mean, a lot, okay? And uh, he, he no joked... There's no such a thing as, as, as enough flow in an aquarium. <laughs> That's the <laughs> way I put it, you know. You cannot make, you cannot have too much flow in an aquarium. It's impossible. <laughs> <risos> e ele está dizendo que se eu tenho muito aqui, é impossível reproduzir o quanto de circulação tem lá nesse lugar, mas que realmente é assim, e é lá onde se encontram os corais, é, que em muitos casos são os mais procurados, a Crow para Short Cake, a Antoceres, a, 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 essa, e a Cintos aí também. Go ahead, talk about a little bit of this place. So, I mean, the... Why the collect? This is a place so you find some strawberry shortcake and clapata and yacinthus, you know, on the on the on the, mm -hmm. on the on the on the outer reef, you know, of the Great Barrier Reef, you know. But on the hard line, you find more of uh, strawberry yeah. shortcake, you know. So mm -hmm. so in this place, the collector go there because they can f they they can feel their boat. They can get enough strawberry shortcake in a very short time. So okay. it's it's another 10 kilometer for them to go. But it's mm -hmm. worth it because they can they can dive within an hour. They can fill the boat with strawberry shortcake. So that's why they go there, you know, because this is a place where the, the, you find the most strawberry shortcake, you know. Mm -hmm. So esse lugar, pessoal, é, é, é só de acrópolis table tem aí. E, e você acha também shortcake no, nos outros lugares da barreira, não, né? Mais afastados. Mas tem muito pouco. Então eles vão aqui porque aqui vale a pena. Ele mergulha em uma hora, ele enche lá o que ele precisa de acrópolis, né? We, we use, this is the most expensive estate, you know, for Acropora, you know, on the reef. You know? mm -hmm. This is a, the most precious, you know, place, you know, for, the, for ah. Acropora to grow on the reef. É, é o lugar que tem mais pressão também, obviamente, né? Yeah. Difficult to reproduce. You, you spoke about that. Very difficult to reproduce, you know. So that's one picture of one strawberry shortcake in the wild. Wow. It's hard to... Uh, wow. Yeah, that's... that's I... I probably a dream to have uh, you know an animal like this in our in our reef tanks. Yeah, it's a it's a nice picture, you know. When wow. I, I get in, the, I look. Yeah. All right, Vincent. Oh my yes. goodness! What a journey, man! What a journey! <laughs> Tô falando, pessoal. Fizemos uma simplesmente uma jornada de aquarismo aqui. É, é impressionante, a gente poderia ficar mais aqui mais quatro horas conversando com o Vincent. So, Vincent, what a journey. We could talk for more four hours, but I know that you have 11 farms to take care. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty busy, you know, but it's, that's okay, you know. We, can, we still have time some, for some few questions, if you have some, you know. Let, let, me, just, to, uh, let me just replicate to you, replicate to you some feedbacks that we are have here in our chat. Right. Such a class of coral. This is a class of coral. You know, it's a completely class of all corals. With this class, will be much more easier to keep 
you know, corals in our tank. So we're not lose coral as crazy. Yeah. That, you know, we, th that's what we're trying to do here, no? Uh, yeah. So, uh, my friend, how can I, just let me tell you, we are planning to have, you know, a meeting with some, uh, we, are, we are running a challenge from off the stores here in Brazil. And we are planning to have a few people in Australia in October. I don't know, you know, if this is going to happen in October but by all this pandemic stuff. But it's just a matter of time. If we would not be able to join us during this, because it's going to be a Triton event in Australia, okay? Uh, but I would like to propose you, if you can join us with that, if you join us, it will be great. But next year, we will have another challenge, another round with the, with the stores. And I will propose okay. you to visit Indonesia, okay? Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, uh, depend on the season, you know, but it's easy to yeah. organize uh, when everything is open, you know. Uh, it's easy yeah. to organize a trip, you know, and uh, to show you some farms and to bring you diving, you know. It's easier than Australia, you know, I think, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Australia, if everything is open, you know, I'm only a flight away, you know, from Cairns, you know, I can be in Cairns, you know, in three, three hours and a half, you know, so it's, wow. it's not too far. Oh, it's close to, good, good. Yeah, yeah, it's not too far. They used to have a direct flight, you know, I hope, you know, when they reopen again, you know, we get this direct flight again, you know. Então, pessoal, só explicando para vocês, o Essan, né, é, é, vive em Cairns, na Austrália, vocês viram a cidade ali, no estado de Queensland, e a gente está planejando ir para lá em outubro, tudo depende de voos, dessa pandemia, etc. Mas estou é, propondo para ele, de, no próximo ano, a gente estar tá lá na Indonésia, visitando a fazenda de corais. Né? E se ele, isso se ele não juntar a essa trip que nós vamos fazer lá. E, e so, my friend, I just say thank you so much for your time. I know it's very oh, precious. Oh. Yeah, and I believe with this evangelism of corals, we will have more uh, happy hip tankers. Yes, great. That's the <laughs> idea, you know. Give you as much knowledge. Don't hesitate to ask me any question, you know, and uh, we can do this over, you know, anytime yeah. you want to. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I will ask you, gently ask you, if you can share your presentation by PDF. You don't need to answer right now, but uh, yeah. later on we, we can discuss, okay? And yeah. because this That's is right. going to be a very precious information for all our followers okay all right so you you already translated it you know so you can share it yeah. as a pdf no problem oh <laughs> one more time vincent all right thanks a lot for your time obrigado. again obrigado <laughs> yeah, and you have to come to brazil as well you know isan is a is a big big you know uh celebrity here in brazil <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, w I would love to come, you know, I mean, uh, I never got the opportunity, you know, but yeah, I would love to come to, yeah. to Brazil. Tô brincando uh, com ele, pessoal, que o Essan já é uma celebridade aqui, né? E que ele tá convidado para vir para cá também. Vamos ter vários eventos aí no próximo ano, se Deus quiser, tá bom? Vincent, just stay here that we, we have 14 seconds of delay and stay here. Yeah. And I, I will uh, stop uh, the transmission. And uh, we can say goodbye uh, offline, ok? Pessoal, All right. bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite. Muito obrigado pela presença de todos vocês. Espero que tenham gostado. O Vincent já autorizou eu compartilhar essa apresentação aqui com vocês em PDF. Vocês vão poder ter isso aí como uma cartilha. Acho que esse é o grande valor que a gente está tentando passar aqui hoje. Beleza, pessoal? Até a próxima. Um abraço. <risos> Just a second, yeah. Yes. Don, my friend, now you can relax. Me too. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs>